and justice. And when these principles are violated, justice must then take its course. Any member or group of members who hold malicious feelings towards the temple or the prophet will violate the divine covenant of the divorce movement or receive their reward from a law for their unjust deeds. I don't know if you know it must also be a law is laid down to them by their prophet if they lose confidence in their prophet. And they should turn in their card and button, cease wearing their turban of fez, and return to the state while the prophet found you. This is a holy and divine movement founded by the prophet Noah Ali. If the prophet is not right, the temple is not right. The prophet, therefore, is sending out a divine plea to all Moorish Americans that they do their part in protecting their prophet in the temple. This is an everlasting movement founded by the prophet through the will of Allah to redeem his people from their sinful ways. I order of prophet Noah Ali. Islam. So, quick recap. Did anybody, anybody remember... Um, I was gonna say you you want the letter to be read. Nah, that's cool, boy. It's all right. It's all. Thank you, though. Um. Anybody? Uh. Anybody remember from like last call, right? Who? How, how do how do we as Moors tie back to the Prophet Muhammad? Bye. Moors. Moorish Americans in particular. Say it again. Lot. Mm, Prophet Muhammad. Uh, Islam. Islam. If I'm not mistaken, the way you described it was the keepers of the of the of the um, of Mecca, the family of the keeper of the keepers of the, of Mecca. Mm -hmm. The guard, those that's guarding the holy city of Mecca, right? Those are the angels of the Asiatics, and remember the prophet said, um, "Are the Moorish Americans any relation to those angels?" He said, "Yes, we have the same father and mother." What father and mother is he talking about? Y'all remember? So remember, as, as Moorish Americans, especially, we tie back to the Prophet Muhammad through Ali and Fatima. Ali is the cousin and son-in-law of Prophet Muhammad. Fatima was Prophet Muhammad's daughter. They had two sons, Hassan and Hussein. They had, they had actually, I think they had three sons, one died in infancy, but they had Hassan and Hussein. Hassan was the oldest, Hussein was the youngest. Hassan died and he left a lineage of children. Hussein, same thing kind of happened, he left a lineage of children. In Shia Islam, these are these are the, the they make up the 12, at the beginning of what's called the 12 Imams, right? In Shia Islam. They also are the connection to those who are considered the Alu Bayt. The Alu Bayt is the house, the, the family of the house. Right. Um, this is kind of like broad because when you talk about the Alubate, now you're not just talking about the direct lineage from Muhammad. You're also talking about, you know, other family members that was part of his tribe. Right. Cousins and stuff like that. Um, but in a more strict sense, the Alubate is those that's connected to the line through Ali. And his two grandsons, Hassan and Hussein. These pe these people also make up what's called the Sharif. Right? Most 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 Muslims or Arabs with the name Sharif, you know, typically uh, those that, it, that adhere kind of more strictly to the creed are, are the only ones with the only ones with that name are connected to this family. And they hold a high position. The, the name gives them like a high position type thing. Um, or historically, that's what it was like. So Hassan, he had a family. Well, his sons or his lineage ended up moving across Arabia into Egypt. They fled Arabia into Egypt and went to the Maghrib, Morocco. 
and basically settled down in Morocco. Um, and the majority of these children of Hassan Hussein on both sides, the majority of their mothers were Berber women. They were Berber slaves or concubines. Um, and you got to understand when it comes to the Berbers, now we're dealing with the Beni Katura or the Beni, uh, the Benu Katir or Katith, right? The, the Benu Katura, these are the children of Abraham through Katura and the Midianites specifically. This is dealing with Josephus. Now you got to get into the antiquities of the Jews and Jose Josephus' work because it, it breaks down where Africa got its name from. Africa actually got his name from one of the grandchildren of Abraham and Keturah. They settled Africa when it was called Libya because it was, you know, the Libyans were just another group of Berbers during that time. You know what I'm saying? These are typically described in the Bible as the children of foot or put, sometimes children of Canaan and Cush. You know, they was all pretty much, the, they was all like the same people. Even like in the you know in the Bible, sometimes it, it gives the lineage a certain way, but in certain traditions, Cush was a son of Canaan, not just a son of. And then the prophet Noble Ali teaches us about the Egyptians who were once the Hamathites, a direct descendant of Mizraim. So Egyptians are Hamathites, right? Mizraim came out of the Canaan the, the, the Canaanite lineage. This is why this Canaanite thing is so prominent and I'm going to get into something about the Canaanites too but I wanted to kind of just go back through the lineage thing and so the first this this individual that went to Morocco his name was Idris Idris the first he's the founder of uh, the city of Fez he founded Fez right and um, so that's 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 that lineage. But then later on, there was another lineage called the the Sadian dynasty. S A A D I the Sad the Saudi dynasty. The prophet in one of his articles talked about the Sadian Moors that were Sada black that were chased out of Spain back into Morocco into North Africa and were enslaved. The Sadian Moors were part of the Sadian dynasty that reigned. You know, there was these type of Moors that you know were in Morocco prior to that, of course, because the Sadian dynasty, they reigned from like 1510 to uh like 16, like the mid 1600s Right? So they was the Moroccan Sharifan dynasty, meaning that they um, claimed descent through the Islamic prophet Muhammad through his grandson Hassan ibn Ali. And then there was an, a man by the name of Muhammad al Kain. Muhammad al Kain, Q A apostrophe I M. In 1510, he's the one that founded the city of Marrakesh or Amuru Kush. Amuru Kush. That's what that's what Marrakesh. The Europeans cannot say Marrakesh, so they said Morocco. That's what it named Morocco come from. It's a corruption of Marrakesh uh, or Amur Kush. Um. So yeah, so that's the now now y'all study up on that particular history of these dynasties in Morocco, right? You know, the dynasties that was in uh, Spain as well, but more so the dynasties that was in Morocco around this, you know, 1400, uh, this 1492 period. Um, and you'll see that the Moors were fighting on multiple fronts. We was fighting the Portuguese. We was fighting the Ottomans. And there was internal strife. There was a civil war going on in Morocco too. 
So these shady and morals, these, you know, there was a lot that was going on between them in, in, in that particular family. Um, it was these Moors um, later on down the line through one of their descendants, Al Mansur. Al Mansur, he invaded. So, let's see. Um, so in 1574, a Moor by the name of Abdullah al Ghalib, his son Muhammad II, al Mutawakil. He came to power. His uncle's name was Abd al Malik. And he tried to obtain support. So these, so uh, Abdullah or Muhammad II, he was in power in Morocco. His uncle, his name was Abd al Malik, was trying to gain support. He wanted to, he wanted to rule Morocco too. So what he was doing, he was trying to gain support from the Ottoman Sultan Murad II or Murad III in Istanbul. So let me let me pull up Islam. Islam, Mo. Islam. Right. I got uh some guests in the uh, waiting room. Oh yeah, get yeah. Get sheet. Thanks. Um. So let me see. Um, so they said the Ottoman Sultan Murad the third. Now, what y'all gotta understand about the Ottomans, Ottomans, the Turks were not Moors. Now, you may have had Moors that were in Turkey or Anatolia, because Anatolia is the real name of Turkey. Turkey was taken over by uh, what they call Turkomen or Turkmen, um, Ataturks. These were people from what they called the Oguz. Oguz is near the Caspian Sea. So they, they Central, they Central Asian people. They're not native to Anatolia. So they from up here. This is the Caspian. They from like this area around here. All right. This is this is called this area here where you see Mecca Medina. This is called the Hijaz. This is called the Hijaz. Right? We went over this too. The, the Hijaz is where in your 101s, where the prophet said that the Garden of Eden was located in the holy city of Mecca, right? The land of Canaan was in the, in the holy city of Mecca, right? And that we are the founders of the holy city of Mecca, right? He said, he said, uh, chapter 45, divine origin of the Asiatic nations, verse two, he said, the key of civilization was and is in the hands of the Asiatic nations, the Moorish who were ancient Moabites and the founders of the holy city of Mecca. This area, which is called the Hijaz, is where this was the land of Canaan. They actually have, have people that live in this area where they, they more down here. They called Bani Kanan, the Banu Kanauna, children of Canaan. They have a they have a plain called the Plain of Kanauna, 
and they have the Wadi Canal, which is the Valley of Canaan. Right? This area is also called, so again, when the prophet said in the one-on-ones that where is the Garden of Eden? In the land of Canaan, in the holy city of Mecca. In the land of Canaan, this is the land of Canaan, not up here. Jerusalem, you know, they, they make, they put Canaan up here. We migrated from this area, really like the so Southern Arabia, right? And then we eventually migrated up here. And these names that we, you know, that you find in the Bible, we, you know, we, you'll find them here. You'll also find them in India. You'll find them in Africa. Cause we took these names, like, look, like, Africa is right across this. It's only this right here is like 10 to 20 miles from this peninsula. It, it's, it's like crossing from, from Morocco to Spain. You think so the people on both sides of the, of the Red Sea, they're the same people. We the same people. You'll find the same names over there as you find over here. Right. So again, this is called the Hijaz. Now, another another name is called the Tahama, which means, oh, well, the name Hijaz means to separate, right? But it's separating it what it does, what it says is it separates the land of the Najd in the east from the land of the Tahama in the west. So the Naj is like Central Arabia. So, I don't got it here, but hold on, let me see. Got a description of the Naj. So this is the red, that red part, that's the Naj. That's Central Arabia. So they're saying that the Hejaz separates that central part from what's called the Tahama. Which is the coast of West? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, West Western Arabia, which again is where this is the land of Canaan, the holy city of Mecca, but they call it the Tahama, right? The Tahama again is where you will find uh, right here. The etymology is Tihamat, which is proto-Semitic, which is a term for sea. It was the ancient Mesopotamian god of the sea and chaos. Listen to this. The word appears in the Hebrew Bible as Tahom, the Genesis. All right, hold on. I'll be right there. Um, it is... Oh, yeah. Okay. So to home, Genesis 1 verse 2, meaning primordial abyss or primordial ocean or abyss. So the T, so the Tahama, this area that's in the land of Canaan, in the holy city of Mecca, where the prophet tells us that we founded, the ancient Moabites founded this. We know that Canaan represents the Canaanites, that all inhabitants of Africa are descendants of the ancient Canaanites that descend from this, this area called the Tahoma, the Tahama, that is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, where it said, just because, you know, I want, I want y'all to have a well-rounded understanding about our demonstration. You know, like nobody else can demonstrate like this on the planet, most. Like, no other Muslims... No Christians, no Sikhs, nobody demonstrating like this. That's taking you to all the way to Genesis, the beginning of Genesis, the first verse, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. That face of the deep, 
that's the Tahama. That's the land of, that's where the land of Canaan is. Where we founded the holy city of Mecca. The ancient Moabites. And you know, the more I dig into the Prophet Noble Jurali, the more I find that his demon, the things he said was super on point. Even from I dropped this in the group today, even from Act Two of our divine constitution and bylaws. Right, we say all meetings are to be open and closed properly according to the circle seven Quran, love for peace, and justice. But then it says Friday is our holy day of rest. Because it was on a Friday that the first man, uh, it was on a Friday that the first man was made in flesh, and it was on a Friday that the first man departed out of flesh and ascended unto his father God Allah. For that cause, Friday is the holy day for all Muslims all over the world. Right? That's actual, there's an actual hadith of from Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace and blessed be upon him. They say, Sala, Sala, I forget how they say, Salah Muslim, something like that. I'm trying to get that down too. Uh, Salah Allahu Alayhi Wasallam. But, um, there's a hadith where he said, that's what he said, that um, Muhammad, I mean, that Adam was born on a Friday and that he died on the same day and that they was banished from the garden on a Friday too. Right, so, so, so again, when, when, when you dealing, when we dealing with real Muslims, because you got a lot of people that have a problem with Prophet Noble Dr. Ali in our demonstration. They have a problem with him calling himself or us referring to him as a prophet. As a matter of fact, there was a, a man in the day of, in the times of the Prophet Noble Dr. Ali um, who had such a problem with the Prophet Noble Dr. Ali that he went as far to, as to go to Egypt and got a fatwa issued against the Prophet Noble Dr. Ali. He actually got the fatwa issue where this uh it's a it's a very prestigious islamic school in in, in 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 egypt and um he was from the sudan he came and um he, you know he, he had a problem with it he went, and again he went as far as you know getting a fatwa issued against the prophet Muhammad, which is just a judicial ruling right an islamic judicial ruling but what happened was the prophet ended up dying that same, passing away that same year that they killed him the same year, and um, the dude never ended up making it back to the United States. He couldn't even get back into the United States after he left and did that for whatever reasons. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, can't go against the prophet. And, you know, a law, but you know they got the they got the fatwa issued and stuff like that. But this is another reason why it's so important that we study uh, this right here. Because a lot of these Muslims out here, they, they deal with hadith. They don't deal with the Quran, right? And Allah said that this is the best hadith. This is the best explanation. And in this book, it, it Allah told Muhammad, if there's something that he didn't understand in this book, he was to go to those that knew the book that came before him. This book. This book tell Muhammad that he's supposed to refer here. So why are we following hadith? Well, we, we, we don't we don't follow hadith. This this what you're supposed to follow tell you to refer to this. So you see this this why we got work to do. We got to put this thing back in order. To be honest, we the only ones that can do it because as much as it might not look like we in a a position we in the best privileged position as Asiatics because we live in this country we in the country that we live in. Oh, I know you know they downtrodden us. They did all these different things, but there's no liberties elsewhere that we have here. Once we get this thing together, then like the prophet said, love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice can be reigning in every land because we can send our missionaries to teach this, this truth, this gospel. This the true in jail. Not this, not the old, the new test. This this not no in jail. This is hadith. Hold on, I'm gonna show y'all what's hadith. This right here, y'all see what it say? New Testament. That's hadith. 
That's what they say Jesus said. This what Jesus said. This the real injil. We got it. But you got to know you got it. Give, give me one second. It's a lot of holes. Um, I forgot where I was at. Um, where I was at? I was talking about. Um, talking about his chapters, prophecy. Anyways. Um, but yeah, so man, I was talking about some of Muslim, Muslims. Well, again, just you know, understanding. Um, oh, yeah, this that's so, yeah, that's hadith. This is the this is the true in jib, right? We have the we have the real in jib, and what this is, is about, it's about the truth, Moors. It's about the truth about who we are, the truth about who the real Arabs are, right? The truth about, you know, Jesus, because we got the 18 missing years of his life. You know what I'm saying? And there's a whole, there's, there's some other things that, you know, we got to um, make sure that we've brushed up. So... Speaking of which, is kind of what I want to get into. Other stuff too, but um, oh yeah, okay. So this is what I wanted to do. All right, so um, so the Prophet Noble Drani, you know, he gave us a bunch of little clues and things like that. Um, one of them is uh, in um, literature, what is Islam? And then he says, what is Islam? Right? He says, Islam is a very simple faith. It requires man to recognize his duties toward God, Allah, his creator, and his fellow creatures. It teaches the supreme duty of living at peace with one's surrounding. It is preeminently the religion of peace. Right? Anybody know why that is? Why? How, how is Islam essentially the, uh, or preeminently the religion of peace? What's the root of Islam? The root of Islam is Salam, which means peace or Aslam, Aslam. Um, It also means to surrender or submit, which is another word for Muslim or Muslim. Now, it's funny because I was reading through the Moorish Holy Quran in chapter 35, verse 15, right? And chapter 35 is, the, is our chapter on religion. Right, 
where you know the first verse is there's there's uh but one God, but a lot of the author, uh creator and governor of the world, almighty, eternal, and incomprehensible. So that, that's like our more shahada. You know, one thing I want to do is like once we, you know, members come in, you know, part of the um conversion or we say initiation process, or whatever, is to quote this particular this particular verse i'm thinking about now you know um again um because i want to you know we got to be careful because even with the demonstration from the east one thing that they do when you take a shahada is they they say uh you know they make you say you know there's only one god but a lot and Muhammad is his is his his last messenger. You you won't, you don't find those two things together in the Quran. Those two sentences, uh, you know, Allah is there's only one, but one Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. That, those are not in the same uh, ayat together, right? You may find Muhammad is the messenger of Allah somewhere, and then you'll find Allah is the there's only one God, but Allah in another place, but they're not in the same place. Um. But I, so, like, one thing I want to, you know, do with us is, you know, once you become a uh, member of the temple is, you know, we have our own form of a shahada, right? Because essentially that's what a shahada is, is you're pledging allegiance to the Muslim community. In the Prophet Muhammad's time, it was, the ummah was a political, it was a state, it was a political state, like, it was a political entity, like, it made, you know, the Quran has Sharia law, it has its own laws. Like, you know what I mean? Muhammad bought laws to the Arabs because they didn't have their own laws. Nobu Ali brought laws for, to us because we didn't have our own laws. The Circle 7 Quran did not do away with the Quran of Mecca. It substantiates it. You know, back of our one-on-one -on -one say we derive our power and authority from the Quran of Mecca. The prophet talks about the Quran being the holy Bible of the Muslims, the Muhammadans. And he said, we have it as the, uh, let me get it right. <laughs> he said, inspired by the lofty teachings of the Quran, we have it as the revealed word of God Allah. We shall foster the principles of his teachings among our members. This is our religious privilege as American citizens. So, you know, when you hear more say stuff about like, we're not Muslims or we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not dealing with the Quran, where? Where, where the prophet said that? You know what I'm saying? It's in the it's in the doctrine that we're supposed to be learning out of the Quran. You know, we have other materials too, Circle 7, 101, Morse literature, everything else that may have came with that, you know, without the untimely passing of the prophet. But you know, our foundation is that is that that Quran and the Bible. You know, so it's very important for us to read those things. But again, peace or Islam or Muslim being sur surrender or submit, 35 verse 15 actually describes a Muslim. It says, pay therefore to his wisdom all honor and veneration and bow down thyself in humble and submissive obedience to his supreme discretion. That's what it is to be a Muslim, to bow down submissively to the obedience of the most high. So that's a jewel in case anybody want to say that we don't practice Islam. It's in our, it's in, to be a Muslim is in our circle seven. I mean, if, if that's not the, if there's a different definition of Muslim, somebody let me know. Pay therefore to his wisdom or honor and veneration bow down thyself in humble and submissive obedience to his supreme discretion. That's right, I gotta highlight that. Let me highlight that. Highlight that. Yeah. It's long. And again, in um, what is Islam? Uh, prophet talks about unity of the father of law, right? That being the first pillar. So 
you know, um, in a more spiritual sense, becoming one with the Father. Now we dealing with that's dealing with the de degree that Jesus demonstrated in this book. He demonstrated how to become one with the Father. God alone. You know what I'm saying? That's in um, you know, your chapters up until what, 20. Yeah, so one through twenty, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, a little a little bit further past uh the beginning, but closer to twenty. But that's dealing with that's dealing with that. Now, again, when it comes to Islam, there's five pillars: faith in one God, prayer, alms or sikat or charity, fasting and hajj. Right? As um as Moorish Americans, we supposed to be practicing all five of those things. Right, you know, how many times you pray a day? It does talk about times to pray in the Quran. It, it's it's a little vague. Like if you're going off hadith and stuff like that, there's the canonical five prayers. Um, but when I read the Quran, I don't tally up five. Like, I mean, I can see where somehow they may have gotten that, but at minimum, you should be praying at least twice a day. Uh, the sunrise or before the sunrise and right shortly after you know, before you go to bed or after the sun sunset that's at minimum and for more it's like it's it's really like it takes you seven it takes you 10 seconds to say your prayer you can't give a lot 20 seconds of your day we give everything else every you know all our time throughout the day you can't take i mean and that's 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 bare minimum again our our ceremony is this here? Face the east, feet on a 45 degree angle, five on the left, two on the right. Allah, Father of the universe, for love, truth, peace, freedom, justice, the love, my protector, my God, my salvation, my day, my day, through 25 degree angle. Ah, man. That's it. That's all you gotta do. You don't gotta, we, we, the, the, the Quran don't talk about, it does say you should prostrate, you know, like, you know, prostrate and pray, but then there's also provision for standing. And it has to do with, being in times of war or in times of danger. We're Moorish Americans. We was labeled black. We was kidnapped, enslaved, slaughtered, relabeled, not given our nationality, taking out everything away from us. That's why we pray standing. Cause we don't know what, we don't know what to expect. We conditioned to just go along to get along, but at any moment it could pop off. That's why we pray standing up. And if you're not studying more your, your your dean if you're not on your dean and you're not really internalizing this thing you're not going to be confident enough to step out into the world and be a more in front of other muslims at, at that because they're going to challenge all of that and if you don't know how to stand on it they're going to make you feel they're going to make you feel i've seen it happen and they know what they're doing they because when you, when you notice dean they're gonna they're gonna do this when you, when you, we're gonna do this in, in this like when you under when you understand this for real for real daddy home daddy's daddy mommy and daddy home mommy and daddy are back we we remember that's what this about. They they systematically have taken our minds from us and have psychological. The European has always won. They have won everything by psychology. They beat each other up using psychology. Then when when, when they realize what's going on, they go in and they the like Germany for example. Germany should have never done what it did. What it did. But they psyched everybody out. They really had and this, this. To be honest, that's how these Germans get down. And they all Germans, to, to be frank. Like for the French, the, all the Europeans, yeah, all them yeah. tribes. They if they pale skin, they they they're Germanic tribe. They from a Germanic tribe. Frenchmen, all of them, they all Germans. You know, they call themselves Visigoth, Ostrogoth, Normans, uh, uh, Lombards. Uh, Ostrogoths, I, I don't care what they call themselves. Vandals, they all Germans. But 
they they can fight. Don't get it twisted. You understand the history, and they are a minority. But they can fight though, and they are very, you know, their main thing is psychological. You know, what I'm saying they psych you out. That's what the Germans did. But anyway, um, faith in Allah, right? Again, that's that is chapter thirty-five, verse one. For Moors that don't know, chapter 35, verse 1, that is your first pillar of Islam. There is but one Allah, the author, creator, governor of the world, almighty, eternal, and comprehensible. That's faith in that's 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 number that's that's the first pillar. Second pillar is prayer. Again, every time we, you know, this is uh um excuse me. Yeah, this act, act two, all means are to be open and closed promptly according to several seven, love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. Right? Um, you know, that's your prayer. In the name of a law, Father of the universe, Father of love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. You're supposed to open and close every meeting like that. According to the circle seven, which uh, in my opinion, I, I feel like he's talking about the, the divine covenant of the Asiatic nation. Chapter 25. Right. I'm not, I'm not mistaken. Yeah, 25. Two plus two plus five equals seven, two. Um, but the holy covenant of the Asiatic nation. Um, but you know, so we have so that's prayer. That's the second, that's the second pillar. Alms, zakat, or charity. So in your daily life, you should definitely, if you see somebody again, this is uh we got a whole a chapter in here about charity. There you go. <laughs> That's the third pillar. You know, charity. We got a whole chapter on that. You know, you also require to pay zakat or, or your, your dues. You know, this is, you know, members must pay their dues and keep in uh, line with all uh, necessities of the uh, temple. I didn't know how you see how you built up shit. No. Um, <clears throat> fasting. You know, Yom Kippur, Ramadan, or you fast throughout, you know, your your week or your month or something like that. But you should practice some sort of fasting. You know, um, I'm not sure. I haven't found that in the, in the actual in the doctrine anywhere, but um, I definitely uh, do recommend Moors practice Ramadan. You know, I think Ramadan this year is in March. It's coming up soon or May. I forget which one, but you know, practice Ramadan. You know, there's very you know, and once once Ramadan come around, we do a demonstration on Ramadan. It's a lot of health benefits to doing Ramadan, right? Um, and then Hajj, right? Hajj or pilgrimage. This is why, you know, we need to have a convention every year. We have to have a convention every year. You know, that's that's your hot, that's your pilgrimage, that's your Hajj. You know, I want to coordinate with some of the Moors um, on, you know, picking a location and preparing for this year's uh, convention, you know? Um, so and, and some other things too, because we 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 gotta really um get to work. I found, you know, I came across an article that was really breaking down how the prophet or it wasn't breaking it down, but it kept it, it would mention certain things in regards to the way that the temple was organized and run back in that in, in his day. You know, like the temple was doing things like providing unemployment and uh health benefits, you know, disability. Uh, benefits for the members you know which is you know it, this is that that this, that's the difference man. you know what i'm saying because again the temple as an entity has the ability to provide that for its members like if you go to a job you work for a corporation what they give you they offer you what insurance health insurance the, all these different things 
we have the ability to offer the same thing. So these are the type of things that have to be offered to our our um our members. Like you know, somebody working, they lose their job. Why they gotta go to the state to get unemployment? They should be able to come to the temple and the temple should be able to go in its treasury for that member that has paid however much. How are we going to calculate it? And you, you know, that's what it's supposed to be there for. You go to the hospital, something happens. We, it, it, should be, it should be to the point where we can subsidize, we can help you subsidize what's going on. So you don't have to go to the state. That's the point, because when you go to the state for these things, this is where jurisdiction comes into play. We got to perfect this more. If we don't perfect this, all this other stuff we talk about, even all the sensational stuff, driving without, you know, having all this, it's not going to matter if we cannot support our people. We got to be able to support our people. We have to be able to show them like, yo, there's another, there's something on the other side. Our people do not want to lose their 401ks. They don't want to lose their benefits. They don't want to lose these. Th this is this this why we have a problem with membership because they holding on to these other things that the United States provided that we could provide, that, but we not provide it. You know what I'm saying? So we got to figure out how to uh, get to the point where that's what it is. You know, where, you know, part of membership is, look, you know, when you come in, you get, we, we, you're going to get health insurance. You know, you, gotta, you need some, look like you can use some new glasses. You know what I'm saying? After about six months or a year, something like, you know, we, we might be able to help you out with that. Help how, Or immediately, however, however it might work. You know what I'm saying? We don't, you know, we got to get to this, we got to get to that point. Like I said, member lose their job, you know, um, they come to the temple. You know what I'm saying? Like, and no, you're not about to be on unemployment forever. You're going to have a 30, you know, 30 to 90 day period <laughs> type thing. Because we can't just, you're not just going to just get paid out. And it's based on what your contribution is. You know what I'm saying? That that type of thing. Um, again, uh, so... So now, right? So somebody, somebody, give me one hundred ones, um, seventeen and eighteen. One hundred one, seventeen, eighteen. Islam sheet. Islam, what thing? Seventeen. What is our religion? Islamism. Eighteen. Is that a new or is that an old time religion? Old time religion. Mm, old time religion. So, what does that what does that mean? What what does the prophet mean by old time religion? Islam. I, I believe the sheep. Uh, um. Well, <laughs> the prophet is talking about um old time religion that that you know ties back into you know Abraham. Yes, more. Slime. Yes. Yes, more. So, Surah 2, verse 130 through 136. It says, And who turns away from the religion of Abraham, but such as debase their souls with folly? Him we chose and rendered pure in this world, and he will be in the hereafter in the ranks of the righteous. Behold, his Lord said to him, bow thy will to me. He said, I bow. Remember in the Moorish Holy Quran, chapter 35, verse 15. Well, I was telling y'all. Um, he said, pay therefore to his wisdom or honor and veneration and bow down thyself in humble and submissive obedience. Behold, his Lord said to him, bow thy will to me. He said, I bow my will to the Lord and cherisher of the universe. And this was the legacy that Abraham left his sons. And so did Jacob. Oh, my son, Allah have chosen the faith for you. Then die not except in the state of submission to Allah. Were ye witnesses when death appeared before Jacob? Behold, he said to his son, what will ye worship after me? They said, we shall worship thy God. 
and the God of thy fathers. Honor thy fathers and mothers, that your days be long on the earth. Of Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, the one true God, to him we bow in Islam. That was a people that have passed away. They shall reap the fruit of Allah, right? So, the old time religion is the religion of Abraham. Another, another, you know, so, y'all, another thing too, like, write these things down, write these verses down so y'all can reference these and have these on deck for yourself. Because you're going to run into Muslim, I had a conversation with Muslim brother online today, and he was saying something, he made a comment about praying in Arabic. And I said, why would somebody, why would somebody have to pray in Arabic? Oh, because it's the, it's the language that the Quran was revealed in. And I'm like, but the Quran said that you're supposed to follow the religion of Abraham. Abraham spoke Hebrew. So you're supposed to pray in Hebrew, right? Like, like what, that made no sense. Because even if you, so you mean to tell me somebody that's deaf, Allah is not going to hear the prayers from their heart? That make no sense. Allah hear the birds sing. What you mean he, you got to speak Arabic for your prayer to mean something? Islamism. You know what I mean, there's a lot of these Arabs that be saying all these prayers. They could do, they could, they could do all, they could, they could recite every prayer. They could recite the whole Quran front to back. But they be having evil in their heart. You it's can't, not... you can't bow yourself down and be and still have evil in your heart and expect. I don't care what language you talk. I just want to add to that too, sheet that that goes along with some of the dogma, especially from the brothers in the East. Um, with modern day Arabism or, or you know their own kind of like dogma or propaganda that they push to to have like this sense of purity, um, you know, which that's where again like we're having this discussion now to really you know pull pull back the layers of the onion to really reveal that you know we are um, in the Quran, we are you know in the Bible. Um, and all the books go together, by the way. Uh, everything ties back. Everything is an Abrahamic religion. So if you knew on the call, like, understand like that, that all of the books are tied together. Um, and, you know, it's, it missed a match. I even seen something today that talked about uh, Prophet, uh, Prophet Muhammad being mentioned in the uh, in the Bible as well. So um, but it's it's again, you know, we, we got to pull back the layers here and really reveal the onion. And, and be able to recite it or at least have an understanding of it. Islam, I yield. Islam, you absolutely you're absolutely right. Absolutely right, more. Because you gotta be able to stand. We gotta be able to stand on this demonstration properly, man. Cause like they they really take us for some sort of a joke. It's not a game. So Surah 3, verse 95 is another one. It says, say, Allah speaketh the truth. Follow the religion of Abraham, the same in faith. He was not of the pagans. So, they're supposed to, we don't follow Muhammad. So, when they talk about the Sunnah and the Hadith, you say, well, hold up. Isn't that following Muhammad? That's following Muhammad, right? Yeah, yeah. That's the, that's the, uh, you know, the demonstration, that's the, uh, what they call it, uh, I forget what word they use, but the example or whatever, right? They say, well, in the Quran, they say that we have to follow the religion of Abraham, the upright one, the Hanif. Then watch what they say. You know what I'm saying? Um, another one is Surah 4, Ayat 25. It says, if any of you have, if any of you have not, oh, <laughs> Islam, the Mecca Grace, how you doing? It's Surah 4, Ayat 125, it says, who can be better in religion than one who submits his whole self to Allah? 
does good and follows the way of Abraham, the true in faith. For Allah did make Abraham for a friend. So again, supposed to follow who? Muhammad? Who, the, who religion? What, what kind of religion is this? This the old time religion. You see how the prophet tied us back to the old time religion in the Quran, being Abraham. See these more the, the the our brothers and sisters in the east. They not again. They not getting these degrees. They all in the hadith and the sunnah. Dogma. Hearsay. And, then, and there's no, look, I'm not bashing the hadith in the sun. Don't get me wrong, because we have our oral statements, you know, but that's not law. And if it don't align with the doctrine, it got to be thrown out. You know, I'm not saying like there's not there's, there's good stuff in the sun, because I use hadith, I use certain hadith and certain sunnahs to support certain things, but it got to align with the Quran. You know, we're going to deal with that whole seal of the prophet thing too last of the prophet seal of the prophet because that's not what what muhammad meant that's not what he said that's not what he meant there's a hadith where he does say um something to the effect that there will be no prophet after me but it's dealing with it's dealing with something i i, I get into it though uh, uh the next one is uh surah six I asked 74 through 79. Right? It says, Lo, Abraham said to his father, Azar, I was talking about Abraham not being paid and stuff like that. Um, now, so, all right, yeah, so now somebody give me Genesis chapter 12, verse 5 through 8. And then somebody else give me Genesis 14, 13 through 20. Because now what I want to I want to get into, I'm gonna give y'all a mean. This is a mean jewel, man. Slime, she um you said chapter 12, verse uh four through eight. Yeah, you can do four through eight. That's cool. Yeah. All and then right. somebody else give me Genesis 14, 13 through 20. Islam. So Abraham left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went to, with him. Abraham Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, uh, Sarah, his nephew, uh, Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived. and And they arrived there. Um, Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah and Setram. At the time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, "To your offspring, I will give this land." So he built an altar there to the to for, uh, to the Lord who had appeared to him. From Wait, there, he went. Islam. He built a. He built a. He built. He built what? Where? An altar on the land of the Canaanites. Oh, so Abram builds an altar to the Most High in the land of Canaan. Remember, he's leaving his homeland because they practice in paganism, and he's called by Allah. But where is he called by Allah to come? And build this altar. Hmm. Old time religion. So, Keep from going. there, he, he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and A A AI on the east. There he built the altar to the Lord and called the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Nagav. All right, cool. That's good. Um, so now I need Genesis 14, verses 13 through 20. 
Islam. Islam. Got it. Yeah. <clears throat> and there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshkel, and brother of Anir, and these were a confederate with Abram. Wait, and what? When... So, so back up. Go back and start naming them people that he was confederate with again? The plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshkel, and brother of Anir, and these were confederate with Abram. Mm. And when uh, Abram heard that his on, brother... Wait, okay. I'm going I'm to I'm let you continue, but I want to make this point because remember now, Abram, Abraham is in the land of the Canaanites. He is... Um, he's dwelling in the plain of Mamre, right? The Amorite, brother of Eshkol, the brother of Anur, and these were confederate with Abram. So these Amorites and Anorites, these are Canaanite people, right? If you go back to Genesis chapter 10, and you look at the children of Canaan, you're going to see Sidon, Heth, which is the Hamathites, Jebusites, and the Amorites, right? So Abram is in the plain of Mamre, the, Cam the, the Amorite, brother of Eshkol and brother of Anur, and these were confederate with him. Confederate means they had an agreement. They came together. There was a confederation. They banded together. You know what I'm saying? Just like the, the uh, Articles of Confederation with the uh, Union States, the, I mean, the, uh, the, the colonies, the original colonies. So think about it in those terms. Right, you got these Amorite, these Canaanite people. You got Abraham and his family, and they coming together to form a union. Right again, old time religion, talking about Abraham and follow, you know, Holy Quran talking about following the religion of Abraham. Now we dealing with Abraham, and see this is why you can't throw away the Bible. This is why the Bible is necessary when it comes to the Quran, because you know the Quran don't give you everything, so you got to refer back to it. So now we refer back to we refer back to Abraham, who these Muslims supposed to be following. And when we go back to Abraham, who he dealing with? He dealing with the Canaanites. He getting all his game when it comes to this 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 creed, this deen. He getting all his game from Canaanites, our ancestors. We ancestors from Abraham Abrahamic side too, but you know. From the beginning of time, these various peoples have been, they've been mixing. You know, the various tribes, they've all mixed. And when you study the Canaanites, Israelites, at points in time, you could not tell a, a Canaanite from an Israelite. They looked the same and their cultures was the same, so much similar. Islam, well, you can continue. Islam. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants born in, in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them, and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods, and also brought again his brother Lot, and his goods, and the women also, and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Shedder le Mur, and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shaveh, which is stop the right king's there. bill. All right, yeah, stop right there. Now, let me explain this too. Lot is the nephew of Abraham and the father of Moab, the Moabites. Remember, the Moors are... The Moorish Americans were the ancient the, the ancient Moabites and the founders of the holy city of Mecca. Okay. Now again, the Prophet Noble Drew Ali, man, like yo, when you really get this, <laughs> yo. So most Arabs over there, they trace their lineage back 
I mean, they go back to the continents. I mean, we could go there, but most of them go back as far as like Ishmael. They say all the Arabs came from Ishmael. It's not true. All Arabs came. The, the, the Israelites are Arabs. Like the Ishmaelites are Arabs. Everybody in the Bible is an Arab. The Bible took place in Arabia. If you don't, I, I recommend you get this book. Uh, the Af the African and Arabian Origins of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, by Dr. Dana Reynolds Marnish. Um, I got another one too. That's a good recommendation. Uh, but again, these people—they all Arabs. Now, we can connect back to the actual, so you got to think about it. In the sense of the Islamic tradition, how we are able to trace back through Ali, the cousin and son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad, in the Abrahamic tradition, because that's another covenant, that, that, that's a covenant too. This covenant, with the Abrahamic covenant, we able to trace back to Abraham directly through his, his nephew, y'all. The one that traveled with him. That he's like Ali to Muhammad. Ali was the first one to accept Islam at like seven years old. He stood up in front of everybody. He was a bunch of grown-ups in the room. And Muhammad asked him, who going to follow? He asked him a question. And he said, if Allah told y'all that I was right, it was about something that was going to happen, a catastrophe, would you believe me? He said, of course. They said, they all said, of course, Muhammad, we will believe you. So then he told him about Islam. And he asked him, Are, will you accept me? Will you accept it? Nobody only person raising their hand was Ali, little seven-year-old boy. Because he grew up with, well, he might have been older than that, but like 10. But he grew up in a household with Muhammad. Just like Lot grew up with Abraham. This is why if, if Abraham was such a devout person that the Most High chose him out of a land of people where they was pagans, just like Muhammad, just like Nobu Ali, because our people pagan. Anyways, um, if, they, if Allah chose Abraham out of these type of people, he had to be like that. Like he's called in the Quran, the upright one, Hanif. If Lot followed his example, was with him every day, watching him do what he do, right? Why would he sleep with his daughter? Why would he sleep with his, his own daughters? Like, even in those times under the Hammurabi code, that was outlawed. Incest is out. Incest was outlawed in Babylon. So a lot, and they knew better than that, because that's not what that's really talking about. And again, at every turn, they 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 have corrupted our our inroad into the story. Oh, the Moabites is Asian people. Oh, they're they're descendants of incest, and this will come from our Israelite brothers and sisters. But then you hit them with this. Well, if, that, if that's the case, why Boaz marry Ruth? You, do you ask him? You believe in Jesus, right? Oh, okay. Oh, wasn't one of his, wasn't his foremother a Moabite? Oh, 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 oh. So the one that is supposedly God made in flesh on, on earth had a, a full mother that was who y'all consider to be from incest? Hmm. But he but, but this is the one that's going to come back and judge the world, right? According to the scripture, right? How you, how do, how y'all going to, see, when you understand, when you know this, you can put them in a box. How you going to reconcile that? And then they're going to run off into a tangent. They're going to move the goalpost about the argument. They're going to start debating something else. Because you got to understand how to stand on this square, Moors. The prophet gave you a solid foundation to stand on. You just got to study. Show yourself approved. That's what it's talking about. What, what, what it said in the, in the Quran. They asked him what to study. He said, study self. And after you've done studying self, study yourself some more. How you study self? You got to study your ancestors. The, the, some of us we don't understand why we the way we are because we never we don't study our yeah, we don't study our ancestors. The Europeans is taking advantage of stuff that's already been going on. We've been killing each other in the hood. Honestly, there has never been a time 
where all of our people have just been hunky dory with each other and there's rose petals and all the tribes is cool. Look at the Bible. This is why we have provisions in our laws for taking care of the widow and the orphan. Why? Because a widow, a, a, a woman would only become a widow or orphan, especially in those times, because we didn't believe in divorce and all that. So you would become a widow or orphan, a, a fatherless person or a husbandless person if you lost your father or husband in war. That's where that provision comes from, taking care of the widow and the orphans. Because we've always been at war with each other. The Europeans are taking advantage of it. Like, hey, you know, he give us, he give us extra stuff to do it with. And stuff that corrupts our minds even more. But we've always been into escaping reality. Where do you think he got it from? He didn't invent nothing. He didn't invent nothing. We got to stop giving him so much credit, man. It's annoying now. Um, see, I start going off on a tangent. Uh, but again, remember the connection, Abraham, Lot, old time religion. This is all connected to us, Moors. We have a line back to all of this. Right? And you'll be surprised, you know, how many people, our brothers in the East, once you start really coming with this truth and be, and of course, you know, our first principle is love. You know, it'd be hard for me to contain myself sometimes when I hear them say certain things. Moors weren't black. You just a sub Saharan N word trying to steal my culture. And they'd be like, oh. But you gotta hum- we got we to gotta be humble about it. And then you give them the breakdown and give them some sources, references with books, titles, authors, page numbers. That's all you're required to do. You know what I'm saying? Stand on your stand on this truth. But you gotta, you gotta just like. Brother, uh, uh, brother John, purity. Brother Issa, love. Purity has to make way for love. A lot of us, it's hard for us to love because we haven't been purified properly yet. That purification process comes with. testing of your will you know you gotta the way that you serve a law and again this is all stuff i'm saying I, this is all in here like you serve a law by serving your fellow man what does a law need what a law you need a prayer from you for a lot don't need your prayers a lot don't need to tell you he great he's the greatest you don't need no sacrifice of blood, no animal, no nothing. Why, why would a law need any? Why would a law need that? You don't need that. What a law need is for you to take care of his. If you're in a better position than somebody, you see somebody that need help, help them. Because that's what happened. You gonna get, you gonna get before judge. It's gonna judgment. They gonna come. You gonna get before a law. He gonna say, "Look, I was hungry. You never fed me." It's about a law, you don't eat. You don't need no food. I was I was clothesless. You ain't even get you ain't help me put you ain't put no clothes on my back. I was I was I was homeless. You ain't help me. You ain't, you ain't help you ain't shelter me. You gonna say Allah? You shelter you from what? You you're the great. You don't need shelter. You gonna say oh, oh remember that time when that person you had a had a, you had a good day. I blessed you that day. You gonna remember that? And then there was somebody that asked you for a favor, and you looked at them like you in disgust. That was me. You denied me. Purity have to make way for love, especially with our people. We don't know how to serve our Allah properly. You know what I'm saying? You gotta, you, you, you gotta give. If you want something from somebody, you gotta do that for other people. If you want your child to love you, love, love the person that you don't like. Or you have a problem with. That's how it works. It's a simple science, but it's hard for us because we don't have patience. 
Anyways, uh, where was we? Oh, Islam, Islam, more my bad. Islam, all right, yeah. all love. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thy enemies into thy hand. And he gave them tithes of all. Islam. Islam. Thank you, more. Um, so, so now you see Abraham comes into Canaan. He meets this man named Melchizedek. First, he, he makes a confederation with uh, the Amorite brother of Eshkel and the brother of Ner. These were Canaanite kings that were under, or they were Canaanite chiefs that were under Melchizedek. Right? So Eshkel and Ner were Amorite Canaanite chiefs under the king Melchizedek. Um, somebody give me Genesis 17 and 5. You can go 17, 5 to 5. Um, Matter of fact, start from you can start from verse one. Verse well, one. Let, well, hold on. Let me let me let me preference this real quick because chapter sixteen is dealing with Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. Remember Hagar, chapter forty-five, verses three, and I'm gonna deal with seven. But let me preference it right. So. Verse 3 says, the Egyptians who were the Hamathites and the direct descendant of Mizraim. And it says, the Arabians, the seed of Hagar. Then this is my problem with verse 7. And my only issue with the Moorish Holy Quran is that I came across some information that leads me to believe that it either was tampered or changed. Because what I saw was that the name Jesus, as it is in our Most Holy Quran presently, during at some point in time during the prophet's time, the name was Isa. So where they have Jesus in here, the name was Isa at some point in time. That makes me also question the one-on-ones where it says the name Jesus meant justice and it came from the East because that never made sense when you're sat right with me because the name Jesus is not from the East. Jesus is a European name. It's a Roman name, actually. Latin. So, or, or it's an English rendition of the Latin name of Jesus. So it's not from the East, which I, 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 it kind of, like I said, it bothered me. And when I seen this, they said it was his name, they used the name Isa. I, it made, made me think like, no, maybe that was the name because Isa is, is Arabic, it, that comes from the East. So I'm thinking maybe the 101s, because again, we have another version of the 101 called the 102s, which probably wasn't like, it might not have been the, uh, another 101, it might've been the original or something happened, you know what I mean? So my issue with verse seven is that it contradicts verse three, which comes before it. And we already know like when we deal with law, we deal with religious law and stuff like that, anything that contradicts something that comes before it, or precedes it is kind of thrown away or it is it's, it's up for interpretation. And I, I want to deal with this because this came up in a debate with a Moor and a pale Arab. And the pale Arab mentioned this verse because he was trying to say, well, what kind of Islam do y'all follow? Y'all Sunni, y'all Shia, y'all Salafi, y'all, you know, whatever it is, you know what I mean? And the more didn't have an answer for him. And then he referenced this verse where he said, well, your prophet said that the Turks were the chief protectors of the Islamic creed in Mecca. And that, well, the Turks are Sunni, so y'all should be Sunni. And I was like, let me, I, I, I had to like 
But, you know, I had to dig, do some digging real quick. So I'm like, hold up. That almost made a little bit of sense. So I'm like, all right, so I'm looking in, first of all, the Turks. Let's let's get this. And I'm going to let you, we're going to get right back to it, boy. I'm not going to lose that Genesis, uh, this Abrahamic demonstration. I want to just make sure. So, Osman the first is the founder of the Turkish Empire or the Ottoman Empire. Osman was a Turk. He's he wasn't the first Turk in that area. The person, like people, they call Turks, but these Turks, they call them Turkomen. Right? It says Osman or Osman Ghazi. was the founder of the Ottoman Empire, first known as the Ottoman Beylik, they go that term, Bey, or Emirate, while initially a small Turkoman principality during Osman's lifetime, his Beylik transformed into a world empire in the centuries after his death. It existed until shortly after the end of World War I. Right, so Turkoman, term for the people of Oguz, Turkic origin. Who is this? What's this Ogul Turk? So, again, remember I said Oguls. If you can see on the map right here, Oguls is right here. Right? Again, this is Arabia. Right? This is uh, Iran, is like here. Iraq is here. Afghanistan. So the, a way to remember, like, because I used to get confused with Iraq and Iran. Iraq is the first. Iraq is like here. This is the t the Tigris and the Euphrates. Are these little? You see these blue lines? These are the Tigris and Euphrates. Iraq starts here, and Iraq comes before Iran because Iran is a. Think about Iran. You got Afghanistan. I, you know, Turkestan. Uh, Turkmenistan, you know, the Stanis. So Iran comes after Iraq and it's closer west. It's pushing more you know, westward. So it's, 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 it's Arabia, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India. These people are Central Asians. Oguz is up here near the Caspian and Black Seas. So they like Albanian, Armenian, Georgian, you know, these the, the Balkans is this way. These are the Balkans. These are the Balkan states over here, right? So and then the Volga trade route, which was so you notice too here it says Khazars, right? So the Khazars, well, these are the Khazarians. These are the ones that picked up the Judy. They picked up Judaism through trade, through what was called the Volga trade route. The Volga trade route came down. It came around here. It either came this way. It, it, I know it ran like all up in here, but in this again, these are the Slavic peoples, the Avars, right? Uh, these is where they was getting all the European slaves from up in here. The Khazars controlled the slave routes in Europe. The Oguz were just like tribal warrior people. The Huns, they was all up. They was like a little bit further over here. Um, the Slavs, these were the slave, these were the slave people, you know, they was, we was slaving all over here. Then the Vikings in them, they were a little more North. So like the slaves came from like this kind of area here, like the Vikings controlled this Western front and Northern front. And then the Khazars would bring slaves down into Arabia and Turkey, like this whole area, they would. This is why this whole area is light now, like you know, Arabia, North Africa. All, all this is all light skinned people because of the thousands of years of uh, European slavery. We were slaving them for thousands of years. We was taking Roman women, Circassian women. We was coming all, all, all up in here in Britain, and you know what I'm saying. So. Um, Another thing with these old maps is really good to look at because what you get to see is y'all see over here where it says Moors Mori. 
right? It says Moors Mori. This is the uh, Mauritania, Morocco area. You have the Warsinese. This is a these are Berber tribes. Gab Kab Kab Kabaon, Guteli, Luite, Mori. See how it says Tuareg tribes. These are the these are the Neo Berbers. The, the Tuaregs was the ones that came over a little later. The ancient Berbers, which is who we descend from, that you can find that in the Negro Love South Carolina uh, section four. It says the term Negro slaves. This is another good reference for y'all. Uh, the Negro Law of South Carolina. Uh, verse number four, right? Section four says the Negro, the term Negro is confined to slave Africans, the ancient Berbers and their descendants. Right? It says it, it does not embrace the free inhabitants of Africa, such as Egyptians, Moors, or the Negro Asiatics, such as the Lascars. Now, Moors was free because Moors were Technically, during this time, Moors were the Berber types that were considered Islamic. So they were governed by an Abrahamic faith. So they was considered, you know, civilized or whatever. The, the ancient Berbers, they didn't consider the ancient Berber peoples the ones that resisted Islam and kind of didn't necessarily convert as soon. These are the ones, these are kind of the ones that they was, we, they were snatching up. They also were snatching up Muslims too. Now, this is why you have the sundry free Moors, Abdul Rahman Ibrahim Ibn Sori, um, and other Muslims uh, that are documented as being in the Americas during that, that period. But again, these are the, uh, those are the ancient Berbers, right? Uh, Zagawas, right? Zagawa, this is the Songhai. Zagawa means Songhai. That's where you get the name Songhai. Uh, you have the Yoruba tribes over here. Uh, Wolof peoples. You got Ghana, the Mende. These are the Mendinka people and all that. The Sao. Then you got the Bantu. See how the Bantu is down here. The Khoisan. You got the Khoisan a little further. The Kushite people, Somalis. Ethiopian, uh, Beja or Bega, the Blemis, the Nabati, Nabata, Nabati, Nabatians, these are the Nabatians, right? Uh, you see, I says Yemen, Hejaz. We know that Hejaz is this whole area, but you see how you got Azd, Karish, Gatafan, Hanifa, the Kab, the Benu Kab. You have the Azd of Oman. The Mara tribes, right? These are all tribes. Like when you look up the Azt people, right? The Quarish, you look up the uh, Gatafan, right? The Cobb people, right? And, you know, where, where did he get the Gassanids, the Lachnids, right? Gassan is Gishon in the Bible. These Gassanids, right? These are Gishon in the Bible. The Lachnids were. So these, the Lachamids were Persian vassals. They were Christians too. They were Christianized Persian uh, Arabs that protected the Persian empire. The Gassanids were Romanized uh, Christian Arabs that protected the Byzantine Roman empire. You see where it says Eastern Roman Byzantine empire? Constantinople is here. This little area that connects Europe to Turkey or Anatolia, Anatolia, which was inhabited by the Hittites. The Hittites, right, who are another Canaanite group of people. Um, I'm going to do a demonstration on the fez, too. I'll just say this. The fez that we wear on our, on our head goes back to the Hittites. Even the, 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 Arab, the Moorish, the shoes that we wear, you see a lot of pictures with Moors, and they be dressed in their gear. And you see the shoes with like the, the curve on it on the front, on the toe. That's Hittite. That's from the Hittites. 
the more of you know, then that's the Moorish connection to the Hittites. Prophet already gave us that, but but these maps are good to look at because you get to see the tribal names. See, I was talking about the Lombards, Burgundies, uh, who else I recognize? The Saxons, the Angles, the Danes, the Frisians, right? Uh, the Croats, Croatians. Right, or, you know, so you start to see some of these names and stuff like that, and you're able to make the uh, connections. Uh, I forgot what I was doing. Uh, okay. All right. Anyway, continue more. I'm sorry. It's loud. So you, you want me to start from the top? Yeah, you can. Islam. Uh, when, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You'll be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I've made you a father of many nations. I will Islam. make you very fruitful. Islam. Thank you, more. So he, again, so now understand, he comes into the land of Canaan. He meets the high priest and king, Melchizedek, right? Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Malik Zadak. Malik means king. Zadak means righteousness. They call Jesus the prince of righteousness. Right. Melchizedek is the king of righteousness. And Jesus is a prince forever in the order of Melchizedek. I mean, he's a priest. He's a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And when, when you when you dealing with this circle seven Quran, it talks about a secret brotherhood. We've, we not, we're not going to deal with that right now. We're going to get into that in a different demonstration, but I'll just leave that there. Um, so he comes in, meets this Melchizedek, gets blessed. He takes in, he goes into a, 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 a covenant with these Canaanite people, get blessed by the king, makes the altar, has his name changed. After he has a child with Hagar, because remember, uh, chapter 16 is dealing with Sarah and Hagar and um, Sarah couldn't bear children. And so she gave her servant Hagar to Abraham to have a child, which was Ishmael who came first. So Ishmael is, is born before Abraham gets his new name, right? So technically, Ishmael is a Canaanite. <laughs> See, this, this again. This is why you gotta we you gotta really understand this book and put stuff together for real. You know, he was a Canaanite Arab, a Arab Canaanite, right? And then after all of this stuff, now he gets his name changed from Abram to Abraham. So he takes on the surname. Ham, because he's in the he's amongst the children of Ham. He's in the land of the Canaanites. These are the children of Ham. So he had to take on just like when Americans or foreigners come to America, they have to take on the uh, kind of you could say suffix American, right? Like they their first name or free national name represents their lineal descent. It represents who their ancestors are. So they may be Egyptian. They come to America. Now you're an Egyptian American. Abram came from the land of Ur in the Chaldees, which is in Arabia. It's not over here. So how we are taught Ur of the Chaldees is in Babylon up here. Babylon was actually Arabia, Babylon, I mean, Chaldea, Babylon in the Old Testament was all in Arabia. But um, so 
Abraham came, he's Abram, a Chaldean. Now he's a ham. So, so you see, he, he went through a naturalization process, so to speak, to, to be able to be recognized amongst the people there. So, so, so Abraham We follow the religion of Abraham, right? He had to become a Canaanite. He had to clothe himself in the citizenship of being a Canaanite in order to receive these blessings from the Most High and be considered as the father of many nations. So this Canaanite connection is very, very important. That's what I'm really, really trying to get at with this. So Abraham becomes, well, Abram becomes Abraham after tying the bloodline with Hagar, the Hamathite. Right, so, so there's another thing. Hagar is a Canaanite woman. She's a Hamathite. They're, they're, they're um, again, remember, she Egyptian. The Bible says she's Egyptian. But what did, mm, mm, mm. Oh my goodness, I just put it together. I just put it together. Because what did the prophet say? Chapter 45, verse 3. He said, The Egyptians who were the Hamathites. Because they will try to separate Hagar from being a Canaanite ish woman. Mm. And again, so back to verse 7 in chapter 40, 45. That's why I was dealing with the old ghouls, Turks, and that and all that. Remember, the Turks are not. So again, when it says the Turks are the true descendants of Hagar, that doesn't even make this why I know that that's a, a, a false of some an insertion because the true descendants of Hagar are not from up here. The Turks are the truest. The Turks come from up here. They from old ghouls, Turkomans. How are they the true descendants of Hagar? And the chief protectors of the Islamic creed in Mecca. They can't be. Mecca down here. How people up here, the true descendants of a woman that's a Canaanite from down here. And chapter um, uh, instruction three above instruction seven says that the Egyptians were the Hamathites the direct descendants of Mizraim, the Arabian seed of Hagar. He tied it all together right there, who Hagar was, an Egyptian who were, who were the Hamathites. So she's a Hamathite woman. Islam, she, um, um, st start over again, please, because it it's, it's definitely a lot. <laughs> and I, I, I see where you're going, but I'm, I'm, I got lost in between. For sure. And I, I appreciate that. Because if I'm ever going too fast, just slow me down. Because I want y'all to get this, right? So, again, so Hagar, right? Um, so, chapter 45, right? It deals, verse 3 deals with Hagar. And if we, if we look at, so... Genesis chapter 16, right? It says, now Sarah, Abraham's wife, bare no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian whose name was Hagar, right? Follow me. So Genesis 16 is breaking down who Hagar is. She's an Egyptian handmaid of Sarah. Now chapter 45 deals with these Egyptians. The prophet lets us know that the, that the Egyptians were Hamathites, a direct descendant of Mizraim, meaning that Egyptians were, uh, again, Egyptians were, were the Hamathites and a direct descendant of, of Mizraim. So you got to understand like the, the term Egyptian and Mizraim connect back to Ham or Hamathites, according to verse three of chapter 45. And yeah. he's saying that the Ara these Arabians, he's, he's saying that these people are Arabians and that they're the seed of Hagar which we understand because when you deal with Ishmael and his family, 
which is uh, where's the line that Ishmael is in? Genesis chapter 25, verses 11 or 12 through 15. Right, so that, that, that these are these these are these so-called Arabians. Now, also the Abraham had children with a woman named Keturah too. Some people say Keturah was actually Hagar, um, because the word Keturah just means incense. Um, but that's a whole other line and stuff like that. But what I'm what I'm getting at is that verse seven in chapter forty-five says it says the Turks are the true descendants of Hagar, who are the chief protectors of the Islamic creed of Mecca. Right, beginning from, from Muhammad the first, the founding of the United Islam by the command of the Great God Allah. But where it says the Turks are the true descendants of Hagar, that doesn't line up with verse three, where it says the Egyptians who were Hamathites and the direct descendant of Israel, the Arabians, the seed of Hagar. So the so my my, my what I think that this is said in the beginning, I think it said the Arabians. Are the true descendants of Hagar who are the chief protect? Because that uh, that aligns with verse three, where he said the Arabians, the seed of Hagar, right? And again, when we go and look at Hagar in the Bible, she is an, she is called an Egyptian woman, and you know, again, she's a Hamathite because they they will try so, uh, and and this is where they will try pale skinned Arabs will try to lay claim to the lineage, um to Abraham through Ishmael, right? Whose mother is Hagar, who is a Hamathite woman, Egyptian Hamathite. So it's like, how are y'all, y'all pet, like y'all not, y'all not the Arabs that's descended from these people. And this is an insertion of this Turk term here. By inserting the, in verse seven, by inserting the Turks are the true descendants of Hagar, it makes it seem like People that look like this, the pale Arabs, right? See, modern day Arabs, right? I, I see, I, I see exactly what you're saying because it, it kind of it put me in a um. It's like a little tizzy here because I'm reading back and forth between three, verse three and seven, and I'm like, I'm trying to make the connection, but it it, it make, but it they can't make that connection through Ishmael because the Turks will be referencing, um. Is is that am I right about that? The Turks will be referencing the true descendants of Hagar, which would uh which will not be the modern day Arabs. Am, am I hearing that correctly? No, no. So the Turks would be rep so that these this is a Turk right here. This guy mm -hmm. right here. Right. This is Osman the first. Now, if verse seven was correct, right, Turks being the true descendants of Hagar. This is who he would be. He would be talking about, but mm. according to the Bible, and according to verse three, the true descendants of Hagar, you know, Hagar looked like uh, uh, Hagar looked like this. Well, she probably was. She definitely wasn't this light. These all these people are Persian. These are Central Asian mixed peoples. You know, these are Central Asian people mixed with Arabs, the true Arabs. You know, the true Arabs are very dark. Uh, matter of fact, let me. Oh, oh, here we go. She probably got somebody. Uh, so. He's like Swari and stuff. But anyway, she would be she she was a dark skin woman. So that again, that 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 makes no sense that that should be there. And that's why I challenge that as an insertion. And you know, we shouldn't be surprised that you know things may have been tampered with. They've tampered with all the things, ah, you know. Got you. Okay, so you saying that that this chapter could have, like you mentioned, it could be an insertion. As opposed yeah. to it being actually what the prophet divinely prepared for us. Right, right, right. Because it, it does contradict itself. It really right. do. 
like so does the latter verse three seems more um you know seems more uh, realistic versus um seven i mean I, I say that because we know that the books has been tampered with there's several things inside of uh of the this quran that you know it, it contradicts itself and there were things that were taken out and then you know names that were 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 you know spelt wrong so i, I definitely understand that yeah so with with so verse three is correct mm. right verse three reads proper in my estimation being you know how he's saying the Egyptians who were the Hamathites, the Rectusinus of Mizraim, you know, the Arabians, the seat of Hagar, you know, Japanese and Chinese that's dealing with something else, but that's correct. So verse seven should read, in my estimation, all Moors might not agree with me, but I know who Turks are. You know, you you might find you may find pictures of Turkish Moors or Moorish Turk. Uh, because these were dark skinned people that were in Anatolia when it was uh, taken over by the Oghuz Turks. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just like nowadays, they'll call you an American Moor. But, or, or they'll say, you know, they might say you're a United States Black or United States Moor. Like, that we not. You know what I mean? We're Moors that were conquered by people that call our land the United States. So now they associate us with. So it's the same thing in Anatolia, which became Turkey. The Moors that were there ended up becoming, or they would call them Turks. And Europeans used the term Turk as a derogatory term for Europeans that went Muslim. So you'll see like in old writings and stuff like that, they'll say, oh, they'll be talking about a European and say, oh, he, he, he went Turk or he turned Turk, meaning he, he turned Muslim because that's what the Turks were. Turks were Indo-Europeans or Central Asians that adopted Islam. As a matter of fact, one dynasty, I think it's the Seljuks, one dynasty of theirs, the Seljuk dynasty, I think it was the Seljuk dynasty, they actually were Central Asian Europeans that tried to create a Muslim Roman Empire. If you look at their, their crest, It's a double-headed eagle. I think it's. I think they got the double-headed crest. Wait, hold on, this is Seljuks. Yeah, so here's their, here's their crest. All right. They called themselves the Sultanate of Rome. So this is the the eagle looking left represents the, the Eastern Roman Empire. The eagle looking right represents the Western Roman Empire. They were trying to bring both of them. See how it says Sultanate of Rome? Rome is the uh is the name for Rome. So they so again, these were <clears throat> these were Central Asian descendants of slaves. Right, this, these Seljuks, uh, Ottoman Turks, they were actually soldiers. They were slave soldiers for the caliphates, particularly the Umayyad and the Abbasids. The Umayyads and the Abbasids were very heavy in slaving, and they would use Europeans as soldier a soldier class as a buffer between them and their families during the times because a lot it was a lot of infighting and, and fr fratricide going on. Like we was killing each other. So in order for some of the sultans to create like a moat in between them and uh, uh, and, and that's what they set up. They ended up, so these Turks, once they kind of took over, they started setting up these things called Baliks. These were little independent fiefdoms or emirates controlled by European Muslims. And um, the, Sol the Seljuks were, they admired Rome. They were Romans that just practiced Islam. Um, they fought during the Crusades. They were very, they were very influential in the Crusades. Like uh, the Crusaders were crusading against Islam, but a lot of the fighters that were fighting against them 
were there were uh Central Asians. Now the Crusaders were French. Most of them were French, Germans. French people are German. They just French French is just a dialect of German. They Germans too. Uh, so it was, and then you also had crusaders that fought for, they fought on the side of the caliphs too. You, so you had crusaders on both sides sometimes. And then you also had Muslims that was fighting with the crusaders. <laughs> it was crazy. So you, you may see a cousin on the other side. Like if you was a crusader, you might you might be like, oh, it's not my cousin fighting. So y'all be in battle, be like, you know, don't kill me though. Like, you know what I mean? There's a lot of that going on. Because the crusaders were mercenaries. They were fight on the side of whoever was paying them the most a lot of times. So again, these are the these are the Turks. They're not they're not Moors. They're not Arabs. Islam. Uh, and um uh, I mean as I'm reading it, it it, it does kind of like because you know it I mean you it 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 proclaims them as being you know the chief protectors of the Islamic creed beginning from Muhammad. So, it, you know, it, it is, it's a little funny, you know what I'm saying? Like, you can't say that in verse 3 and then say this in verse 7, so. Right. And what, I, believe, yeah. I believe that insertion was put there to really, like, throw us off and yeah. keep the propaganda going about these pale Arabs being the lead. Like, y'all not descended from Muhammad. Turks don't descend from Muhammad. They don't descend from Hagar. And they're not the chief protectors of the Islamic creed. Yeah, like, you know, like, so I'm willing, as a Moorish American, I'm, I can stand on no that that's an insertion. That's not it. Contra, it contradicts with the, the verse that come before it, and it doesn't add up biblically, genealogically, or, or historically. Because historically, we, you know, I mean, respectfully, we already know where modern day Arabs come from, anyways. And mostly right. it's from the the concubines. Right. So it wouldn't, you know, wouldn't line up. Uh, I think we did. You know, you did a great job a couple weeks ago, just going over. Um, you know, what they look like and, and what the references, you know, tie, you know, tie back to these people being shoot, black, purple, blue. <laughs> blue, black. And the yeah. blue, so the blue, black, I'll break that down real quick. Blue, black is the, the, the tint or hint that it meant, emits off of a very, very, very uh, dark, complex, so it's not just dark, but they, these are people that are, they, their tone is just one sheen. It's like a, they have, they're very dark. And then there's like this gloss, this sheen over them. Like if you put light on them, they probably, they look white kind of, right? But in the dark, the in the moonlight, when these dark people like that are in the moonlight, they show, they look blue or purple. So if you ever get you a, Fine dark skinned sister, or you sisters get you a dark skinned brother, you know, that moon looking kind of full. Maybe go outside, check you out in this moonlight. Hmm. That's where that term will come from blue, being blue, black. Uh, so Melchizedek believed in the one God. The Most High, El Ilion, right? Um, somebody give me. Let me get uh, uh Psalms. Well, no, give me Hebrews five and six. And then Hebrews 7 and 1. So that's uh, Hebrews 5, 6. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 6 and 10. About, and then Hebrews chapter 7. And in Psalms... Chapter 110, verse 4 it says, The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, this is this is David. So David part of this order too. 
I already explained that Melchizedek means king of righteousness. No. Let's see. If I keep forgetting, I got, got this computer. So. Hebrews chapter five, chapter five, King James. So, Hebrews five, verse six, it says, "As he saith, also in another place, thou art forever, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek." Right, it says, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him. Called of God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Right, the order, now remember again, man, the order of Melchizedek, we're dealing with Abraham. But you see how this, this, this order, this faith, this, 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 his creed go back to Melchizedek. Right now, Hebrew chapter seven, it says, now Hebrews is in the New Testament. It says, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God. Remember this term because more, understand this. You have God, and then you have the Most High God. Y'all, y'all following me? Because I'm gonna give y'all the name of the Most High God. I'm gonna give y'all the name of the Most High God, and I put this together because. Again, we dealing with as as a Muslim people, Moors, right? We understand we not dogmatic. We not we don't follow any. We don't we follow the books. We not we don't follow Muhammad. You know we follow these people in as much as. We can take the good from them and the example and the righteous qualities that they had and stuff like that. But as far as our creed is concerned, we said we are instructed in the Holy Quran and in our doctrine, our, our Moorish doctrine, that we follow the old time religion, that we practice the old time religion being Islamism. In the Quran, that being the religion of Abraham. Abraham got this creed from a man named Melchizedek and these Canaanite people. Y'all following me? So it's only it's only right that Abraham would have been given the true the true name of this most high God. Or this, you know what I'm saying? He would have been given the name of this most high God. He was dealing with Melchizedek. Why well, Melchizedek not gonna, you know what I'm saying? So who was this? So, who is this most high God of the Canaanites? I don't know if I added this little tidbit in here. I'm going to I'm gonna have to try to remember to add this. <laughs> So this is the most high God or representation of the most high God of the Canaanites. It 
His name is L. It's another reason why you'll see most Hebrew names have L at the end. <clears throat> most Moorish names have L at the end. No. Notice he has on, on a liberty cap. Some would say Fez Tarbush, maybe. Right? Got a uh, tunic thing on. So that 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 garb, right, that he's wearing is not Arab. It's not pale skinned Arab. Go back to the Canaanites. Right. So El was the god of the Canaanites. He was normally represented by a bull. He had a consort by the name of Asherah. Um, I forget what her name is in the Bible. It's like mother of heaven or something like that. The, the Hittites also um, worship the God kind of along the same name as El. Remember the Hittites, I explained, were the original inhabitants of modern day Turkey. So even with in another name for Hittites is the Hatti, Hatti, H-A-T-T-I. You see here, you see Amorites down here, Ashur, Asur, that's another, uh, uh, you see Amaru, Amaru right here, Amaru. So it was another, you know, the fam another tribe of the family lived a little more north. These was the Hittites. The Hittite Empire from 1300 BC. Remember, remember what the prophet said: the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorite brethren sojourn from the land of Canaan, seeking new homes. Um, <coughs> um, El was also known as Anu or Enlil. And Lil is dealing with the Ugaritic and the Sumerians. So in Lil was El. Right? El separated heaven and earth and caused the or excuse me, in Lil separated heaven and earth and caused the flood in Sumerian mythology. Uh it says. According to Pantheon, known in Ugarit as Elohim, right here, Elohim, right now, Elohim are, con are considered the children of El. Follow me now. Because According to the one on ones, who is Elohim? Who did who did Elohim create? What did Elohim create? Man, I get that right, Sheik. Uh, what do you say? Man. Yeah, slums. Elohim created everything that was, is, and evermore to be. That's what the one on one say. He created the devil too. That's what the one on one say. Who made the devil? Elohim. Who is Elohim? The seven creative spirits that created everything that whatever was, is, and ever more to be. And Elohim means gods, so it's plural. Right? And Elohim were considered the children of El. Right? Now, 
the creator was known as Elion. This, this, this is the true name of the Most High, the Most High God. They would say El Elion, God Most High, or God Most High God. So Elion is the true name of the Most High God according to the Canaanites. So like, just so like, just on a personal level, when I pray personally, like not when I do like the most American prayer, you know, publicly and stuff like that, but when I'm, you know, doing my thing and I do my, you know, I make my salat, my sutra, whatever, I use the term, I don't use the term a lot. I personally use the term Elion. Um, another reference is in the Bible, Jesus, when he was on the cross, or they say, as he said, they say he was on the cross, he cried out to God. And when he cried out to God, he said, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. Eli, Eli means my God, my God. Right? Eli, Eli. It sounds similar to Allah, but Eli or El is the is um it's not the most it's not the most high God. The most high God name is El Elion or Elion. Right. So that's a that's a that's a that's a jewel for y'all. You may you you may see in other places the the name that they use for the most high might be something different, but for the most for for from my understanding, again we following Abraham. Abraham got this from a Canaanite named Melchizedek. Melchizedek, when he said, "Um, blessed be the most high God," he when he said it, he said, "Blessed be Elion." Elion. Right? Because some people, some people will say Elohim, some people will say El Shaddai, some people say uh, El Adonai, some will say El, whatever. Those are not, that's not God most high. God most high is El Elion or Elion. Now, let's figure out where Elion come from. <laughs> Remember, Elohim, these are his sons or his children. Elion was the father of divinities, and it's said that he married Be Beruf or Beirut, the city. Right? So it's, it's a marriage of divinity with the city. Think of Melkert. In Tyree or Tyr, Chamash in Moab, Tanit and Baal Hammon in Carthage, and Yah in Jerusalem. So when it says that Elion had a wife or concert named uh, Beirut, which is Beirut, the city, it just means that that, that most, that, that deity represented that city so when you read in the bible and you hear like this god and his wife that god or this god married this god is talking about the divinity that is represented of those people being married to the city or the physical realm of the people because you have to connect as above to so below this is not Paganism. So it says, in Canaanite mythology, there were twin mountains that held up the firmament bounding the earth. El Shaddai is derived from the Akkadian Shad Shad Shadu, meaning mountain, and Shaddai is, or Shadda, or Shadda'u meaning mountain dweller, one of the names of Amaru or Amorite or Amorites. So even that name, El Shaddai or Shaddai come from Canaanite people too. It says Atlas was one of the Elohim. Y'all remember, remember we break, we break 
we broke down Atlas and who Atlas was. Atlas is connected to the word Atlantis. Atlas is connected to the word Atlantis. The Atlas Mountains are located in Mauritania. Mauritania, land of the Moors. Y'all following it? No, y'all look, y'all gonna have to pry this to this again. Uh, this, what we, what's going on here is we connect them back to the most high, y'all. The Moors, under the demonstration brought to us by Prophet Noble Jali, you can connect back to the most high God, El Elyon. The Father God of Allah. <laughs> Let me not say that too loud, man. They're going to get they gonna really get man. Moors, y'all got a demonstration that's unmatched. I'm telling you. It says <clears throat> Allah was one of the Elohim, which fits into the oh, excuse me, Atlas was one of the Elohim, which fits into the story of El Shaddai as God of the mountains. Atlas was also said to be the first king of Mauritania in North Africa. He was king of Atlantis. Atlas' grandfather was said to be Elion, king of Phoenicia, who lived in Biblios with his wife, Beruth. So, again, Elohim are the sons of El. Or Elion, the, the sons of the Most High God, right? Because remember, Elion or Elohim are plural. We're dealing with a singular entity, one, right? Whose wife is Beruf, quote unquote wife, right? It says that Atlas was one of his sons. And that Atlas was to hold up these mountains. Remember, Shaddai, Al Shaddai, it means mountain or mountain dwellers, it's connected to mountains. And then Atlas also connected to mountains. Atlas being the son of El, El Shaddai or Shaddai being connected, connected to as being like a subordinate to Eliona El. And it says that Atlas was the king of Mauritania and At Atlantis. His grandfather was Elion. Right? Because Atlas is uh, one of the Elohim. And then this Elion or Elion is king of Phoenicia. And he lived in Biblos. No. <laughs> <laughs> Boom, book <clock. laughs> yeah. What we read, we, what we read, we read what? We read the what? The Bible, the Biblos. Elion, the Most High God, the Father of the Elohim that created everything. Is the king of Phoenicia, meaning he's the ruler of these Phoenician people, these Canaanites. Elion or Elion, God most high, Genesis 14, verse 20. It says, and when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed, oh, 14, verse 20. Oh, and blessed be the most high God, which he, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hands. And he gave him tithes to all. That's Melchizedek, blessing Elion. So that's, so Genesis 14, 20 is dealing with, in, in, in Genesis 22, Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have, and remember, and so Elion was also the king of um well he was the king of Salem. I have well, I guess Sodom too, because Sodom was a city of it says, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God. 
I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord because because everybody pray to the Lord. Right. He said, no, the, to the Lord, El Elyon, most high God. It says, Abraham makes oath to El Elyon. So that's what he did in, in dealing with Melchizedek. He made an oath to El Elyon. So if we, again, if we're supposed to follow the religion of Abraham, what God did Abraham follow? El Elyon, God most high. It says, the ancient God of Salem in Jerusalem. Psalm 78, verse 35. Says it says, and they remembered that God was their rock and the high God their redeemer. Mm, so, so Psalm 78, verse 35 mentions two separate gods or two separate entities. It says, and they remember that God or El was their rock and the high God, their redeemer. Something to think about. So Elohim which represents God in, in this is the rock. And Elion is the redeemer. It has been suggested that the reference to El Elion, maker of heaven and earth in Genesis 14, 19, and 22, ref reflects Canaanite background. The phrasing in Genesis resembles a retelling of Canaanite religious traditions in Philo of Biblios's account of Phoenician history in which Elion was progenitor of Uranus, the sky, and Gia, the earth. Elion, the most high God, numbers 24 and 16. Numbers 24, 16 says, he hath said, which heard the words of God, 24, 16. Oh, he has said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the, version, the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. So Elion, in, in that is the Most High. Deuteronomy 32, 8. Me. It says, when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. So the Most High, again. It says, the Most High in Ugaric, in Ugaritic text says, the 70 sons of El. So this, this El, or Elion, has 70 sons. This is, again, this is in the account of Philo, Philo, P-H-I-L-O, of Biblios, his account of Phoenician history. So, and again, normally when these ancient historians wrote about the Canaanites or certain people like, like this one right here is talking about the Phoenician history of El and stuff, th these are these chronicles are describing our ancestors and our ancestry. This is all history of us. So it says in the Ugaritic text, El has 70 sons. One of these sons was the God of Israel, Yahweh. Now, they also, 
th- th- I didn't get into this here, but this also ties into the Kenite demonstration because the Kenites and the Midianites or the Midianites in particular worship, well, the Kenites really. And the Kenites were Hamathites too, right? They was connected to the Canaanites and they worshiped the God called Yahweh in Mount Seir. Seir was uh, the progenitor of these, well, not the progenitor of these Kenite people, but it was connected to the Kenites. And Seir was um, a Canaanite, a Horite, actually, the Horite. The Horites were Canaanite people. They were Hamathites. And they were connected to the Edomites, right? And Edom, because Edom had children with Canaanite women. Uh, Esau had children with Canaanite women. And Esau and Edom are not Europeans, just to make it clear. I, I know that's what our Hebrew brothers put out there. Stuff like that. That's not true. Um, it says, it may also mean that Elion, having given the other nations to his sons, now took Israel for himself under the name of Tetragrammaton, identified with Yahweh in Samuel Second Samuel 22 and 14, Lord equals Yahweh, most high equals Elion. So in 2 Samuel 22, in 2 Samuel 22, verse 14, 13, 14, all right. It says, Samuel. Twenty-two and fourteen says, "the <clears throat> The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered His voice." So here, the Lord is Yahweh, and the Most High is Elion. So again, it's describing two different entities, right? It says, "The Lord thundered from heaven." And the Most High uttered his voice. The Lord the Most High. That's what, or they may be trying to say that the, they, they're calling him the Lord Most High. He's it's also he's also mentioned in Isaiah 14, 13, and 14, dealing with the fall of Shaitan. Right, Isaiah 14, verse 13, yeah, and 14, where it says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Right? He's saying, I will be like El Elyon. Or Elyon. But then in 13, he only says, I will exalt the throne above the stars of God. And then also in Psalm 97, 9, he uses the same kind of terminology. Where it says, for thou, Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted above all gods. It said, in Eusebius, Eusebius was another historian of the time. In Eusebius' account of Philo of Biblios, of Philo of Biblios, of Biblos, 64 AD to 141 AD, the record of Phoenician deities, Elion, whom he calls Hypsistos, the highest, he says, in their time is born a certain Elion called the Most High and a female named Baruf. And these dwell in the neighborhood of Biblos. And from them is born Apegios, Apegios, or Autochton who they call Scott. 
autochton, you hear that word a lot with Moors. They say, you know, either autochtonous or autochton, I mean, kind of like indigenous. Um, autochton was a son of Elion. And so that's all I got for that. That's that little demonstration right there. So that again is the name of the, 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 the real name of the most high God is Elion. So you know when you're making your prayers, making your intentions, start using a different name. You might might get some different outcomes because now you can be heard. How you how you gonna call on somebody you're not even using their right name? How they gonna hear you? Mm. That's this, you know, depending on your level of spirituality, it's very deep to have that, that name. Because most people are going to tell you the, the name of the, you know, the, the the real name of God. They're going to say Yahweh. They may say Tetragrammaton. They may say Adonai. El Shaddai. Nobody, they do not know Elion. But y'all do. Because again, you're supposed to follow according to the Holy Quran. We're supposed to follow the religion of Abraham. You know what I mean, I got a whole, I got a demonstration on that too. Um, we'll get into that. Yeah, we'll get into a little bit of this tomorrow um, or Sunday. We'll deal with. Some of some of the issues that most Muslims have with our demonstration, we're, we're going to build on that, but we're going to attack it using the Quran, their own document or our own document type thing. Um, but again, tying back to the religion of Abraham and the way of Abraham, the 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 faith, what they call him, the upright one, the true in heart. Right, he he uh, the Mecca no problem, peace and love says. Um, he um, dang, what was it? Oh, he followed again. He followed the religion of the. Uh, 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 he followed Melchizedek, the Most High, El Elyon. So I don't know. For me, it just makes sense that that's the name that I call him. You know what I'm saying? Um, and again, as a Moorish American, you know, you can stand on that. You know, um, I don't know. It's just it's just very good to have like that that level of understanding about Abraham, <laughs> because again, these people will try to hijack our demonstration and make it their own. You know that's why Noble Drew Ali put such an emphasis, in my opinion, on letting us know who these Canaanite people were and that Jesus was from the true blood of the Canaanites, the Moabites, the inhabitants of Africa. You know what I'm saying? Um, and just having those little bullet points or those reference points to be able to um, look into who these people were, who were the Moabites, who were their ancestors, who were their uh, descendants, you know, who did they become confederate with, you know, what tribes and what peoples, how do these tribes and people connect to the Israelite people and the covenants, the various covenants that the Most High made, right? Because, you know, he made a covenant with Adam. He made a covenant with Abraham. He made a covenant with Moses. You know, he made a covenant with David. 
He made a covenant with Jesus. And we have a holy covenant tool of the Asiatic nations. Right? Your, your, your Act 7. This holy covenant. Um, what, what, uh, oh, what he said. Act 7. It's at the end. Um, Uh, I, should, I should know this with the top, top. Uh, right. This divine covenant is from your holy prophet, noble draw lead through the guiding of Father God Allah. Right? So we got a, we got another we got another covenant. Holy covenant of the Asiatic nations, which is you know. Incorporation of divine constitution and bylaws. You know what I'm saying? So, again, we just got to understand how to put things in perspective, you know, because if we don't understand the doctrine, and the, you know, the books and stuff like that, you know, it's easy to be led astray. The next thing you know, you following somebody else's demonstration. Ain't no, there, and you know, there's no reason to uh, reinvent the wheel. Because again, the Quran tell you if you got a question or you doubt something that's in the Quran, when you understand about something that's in the Quran, you're supposed to go to the Bible with those that know the Bible. We descend from those that know the Bible too. You know, they, 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 now you're dealing with the Ansar demonstration, dealing with the Owls tribes and the, the Kadraj tribe. Right, these are these are the Ansar or the helpers of or the aiders of Allah that lived in Medina and helped Muhammad during his time was the first converts. Um, who majority of the uh, medieval historians described as being huge and black. Like they use terms like black as crows, black as tar, because there's a volcano in Arabia. That's you know, most of these, some of these people inhabit the area. And I think it's the Hara people. They called them, they said that they was black as tar. I mean, black as lava. You know, Muhammad's, um, they call them the Sahaba. So as a matter of fact, I I normally, so this, this is a site that I use to defend that Arabs, the original Arabs, were so-called black people, right? There's a website called uh, this right here. Oh. Elijah whatever this is, dot com. I'll drop it in the chat for y'all. I don't, and to, like Moors, understand. I don't be giving out a lot of this type of stuff. Like, uh, like you, and I do not. I be keeping a lot of. I keep some, a lot of stuff. I keep under my hat because, like, I know how vital this 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 information is. It's like gold. Like, when you really understand knowledge, like the truth, how valuable it is. You know, because some people they get stuff and they don't really. It's not serious for them. You know what I'm saying? But if you want this, if you want this link, I, when I'm online and I'll be arguing with people, I'll come here, I'll just copy and paste it. Because this is called the red and the black. And it's dealing with how Arabs used colors to describe people and how Arabs describe their various people. Right? And uh, so this is most of the slaves were black in color. That's just one person because you know Arabs had black slaves too. But it says the Arabs enslaved others than black. Um, uh, this is Sahih Muslim Book of Oaths. Ayub said we were sitting in the company of Abu Musa that he called for food, and it consisted of flesh of fowl. It was it was then that a person of the Banu Tamim visited him. His complexion was red, resembling a slave. He said, "Come and join in the food." He showed reluctance, 
Abu Musa said, come on, for I saw Allah's messenger, may peace be upon him, eating it, fowls meat, whereupon he said, I saw that. So he's just describing, but he's describing this person who is, his complexion was red, resembling a slave. So slaves were normally red. Now, it says right here, the, the saying read as if he was a slave commenced in the subject of the, of the fifth of the share of the war booty as if from the slaves, the war booty said. It means he was the Roman prisoners of, he was from the Roman prisoners of war, right? The Romans was Europeans during that time because the Arabs considered pale skin or white skin is red. They didn't use the term white. When they did use the term white, it meant someone that was pure and of good character. The same way that we learn in our one-on-ones that white mean purity. Right? Um, <clears throat> so it says right here, Uyanatu ibn Hassan said, O leader of the believers, verily I see the non-Arabs, Persians, increasing in number in your country. Beware of them. He said, Amir al mumin they have been holding on to the ropes of Islam. Look at the red, blue-eyed from them striving in this religion of Islam. And he poked his stick into the stomach of Umar. May Allah be pleased with him. So he's saying that these Europeans that are blue-eyed, red-skinned, or pale-skinned, they're gonna they're taking over Islam. These non-Persian Arab people. Right. Um, there's a, and there's like a whole bunch of stuff here, man. Like uh Yeah, this this fire sheet Islam. Yeah, yeah, this joint I'm telling you, man. So here are the different like levels of blackness in humans. So they say uh Adam, Adam Shahid Shahid, Aladuma, Ahdar, Aswad. Islam, Asham, Asmar, Abiyad. Abiyad is like white or red or white. But um, it says white is only used for people to mean being far from being impure and free from defects. And again, it, they give you the reference. So this is Abu uh, Taib al Lahwi, 350AH, which is like. 900 year 950 or something like that it says said in his book the book of opposites in the speech of the arabs page 40 white is so here so again this is the reference so when they because they'll read certain arabic texts that'll say muhammad was white or bright or they'll describe an arab as being white well when well according to arab tradition when they're describing that person as being white it just means that he's pure free from defects Ibn Mandur, the author of the San al Ahab, narrates from Al Azari on page 209. When the Arabs say that a man is white or a woman is white, they mean that he is pure, clean, free from ugliness. They don't mean that he has white complexion, but they mean that someone is honorable and pure and clean. When they say that a person's face is white, they mean that his complexion is free from marks and a type of blackness that is unattractive. So meaning it's one tone, right? They, they don't got blotches and acne and bumps on their face and stuff like that. You know, they got a, he's a white face. His face is white, he's a white face, meaning it's free from blemishes and the type of blackness that is not, uh, that is unattractive, right? It's, so it's, it's free from marks and the types of blackness that's unattractive. So the type of blackness is ugly, is free from that. So I'll, Al Talab is quoted in, in the Son of Arab saying, The Arabs do not say a man is white to mean that he is white in color. It is only meant to, it is only said to mean that the person is pure and free from any defects. So, again, all these various, uh, go ahead. No, nah, you know, the references are, are, it just, you know, it cuts even deeper and, um, it, it it cuts into the ideology, ideology if you're already in that kind of mindset between like the color code systems and because um, each culture around the world 
has their own color code system. So here's another color code system where they're identifying what is what, you know. Um, man, that's uh, that's solid. She that is solid, man. Um, Slime, I yield on that sheet. Mm-hmm, yes, sir. Um, let me see. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, the Sahaba. So, so Sahaba, the Sahaba are the companions of Muhammad. These are the earliest converts to Islam. They're not the ones. Well, some of them were the ones that were in the of Mecca that gave Muhammad some trouble or problems during it. His uh, proselytizing. They didn't want. They didn't want Islam or what Muhammad brought in Mecca because they feared that it would take away from their their prophets. Because again, the families in Mecca controlled the Kaaba, and the Kaaba was the main. You know, Mecca was the main center of like yearly pilgrimage. So they made a lot of money during that time. And of course, you know, people. It's like New York. You know what I'm saying? Like it's it's, it's pop, it's buzzing in. You know what I mean? Like it's always activity. So, but it was all based around paganism. So of course they didn't want Muhammad there because he was going. They they felt threatened threatened that he was going to slow up their money. Now, the Sahaba again. These were the companions or the close companions of Muhammad. Now, I don't think they have Umar ibn Al Khattab here. I think I don't think this page works. Oh, they do got Umar. Oh, they must have just, I didn't see this up here. So Umar ibn al-Qatab. Umar was a companion of Muhammad during the time of Muhammad. He also was the second caliph after Muhammad. Right? He came after a man by the name of Abu Bakr. So it goes Muhammad. This And this is Sunni tradition. Is Muhammad. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. So Umar ibn al-Khattab, this is who this is. And Umar ibn al-Khattab was the cousin of Khalid ibn al-Walid, which who was arguably one of the greatest military generals of all time. He never lost a battle. He won like 50 battles uh, pretty much in ways that he never should have won. Like he did the impossible multiple times. Um, so this is his cousin. This is Umar's uh, uh, Khalid, first cousin. And uh, Umar became the again he became the second caliph or leader of the Muslim community or Muslim nation or empire which was really an Arab empire um, after Muhammad so it says there are many narrations about Umar ibn al-Khattab may Allah be pleased with him uh, however most of them are weak but some strange reason these weak narrators narrations are in many books the most famous of the narrations include uh, narrations that come from a known fabricator of hadith called al-wakdi who has been widely refuted and rejected by the majority of scholars oh. hold on one second one second Uh, he says, one of the most earliest, if not earliest sources of these hadith can be found in Al-Tabakhat Al-Kubara by Ibn Sa'd, who starts off with the true and correct narration regarding Umar Ibn Al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. So on page 239, chapter 3 of Tabakhat Al-Kubara, Ibn Sa'd starts with the Shahi hadith narrated by Zir Ibn Habish. He says, I saw Umar ibn al-Khattab leaving the exit of the people of Medina, and he was an Adam-colored man, tall, ambidextrous, bald. He walking fast, towering the people as if he was riding a beast. So 
not only was he Adam in color, now I'm I'm gonna just split the screen because I need to go to the other page, but I don't want to go back on that page because I want to describe. I want I want you to see what Adam means. So Adam or Adam. So Ibn Mansur al Talabi which is the guy they kind of referenced already again. You see these names, these names are referenced. And I like this website because you don't got to go get the books. It's going to take you directly to the, the references that we're looking for are right here on this page or else you would have to get volumes of books and sift through hundreds of pages just to be finding these various things. Um, but it says the color Adam is blackness in humans. And when referring to camels, it means whiteness. So when referring to humans, like it was referring to Ibn uh, 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 Umar ibn al-Khattab, it means he was a black colored man, tall, ambidextrous, bald, and he walked fast, towering over people as if he was riding a horse. So he was very tall. So just, just imagine, like you ever seen somebody on a horse? That's how tall he was. Now, these a lot of these some of these Arabs that are from these tribes that are you know deep within Arabia and stuff like that, they were described as giant people, like in the Bible how the Nephilim and all of this, they describe these are the giant people that they're talking about, you know the Amorite people these uh, certain other people they was notably they were known as being giant like very tall, and some of these people that descend from you know clans and tribes like. Umar ibn al-Khattab, some of them were said to be over seven and eight feet tall. Like you see uh, Wimble, Wimby Way, Wimble Weah in, in, that play for the Spurs. Imagine a thousand soldiers, his, his height and taller and jet black running down on you. You know how scary that is? And he got a big scimitar and a uh, a spear? Yeah, a bunch of LeBron James and Joel Embiid. <laughs> exactly. And, and see, I'm glad you said that more because that's exact. See, Joel Embiid and, and LeBron and all these athletes that we have, you, they, they are supposed to be our war, the, the, our war generals. These are supposed to be men that are supposed to be part of – they're not supposed to be running around on no daggone basketball court in no field. They're supposed to be running around on a battlefield, learning tactics to defend the, the nation. Um, exactly. And like you said, a bunch of Joel Embiid's and LeBron's. Who want problems with that? Yeah, nah. You see why they want us to believe we black? Because if we connect back to this truth and we make that connection, a bunch of LeBron's and Joel Embiid's in the uh, in the move hmm. the move T for us? Oh no, he's they, the, they Moors is back. Mm -hmm. They know their history. They got red feathers on their head. It's like you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying. Nobody want to deal with that heat, but it, you know, it, but that's why I was mentioning like the color code caste system. You know what I mean? The, it's you know you see it it's described using it as descriptions, but you also see it in other societies where it's used as a caste system, um, using colors. But it man, it, it like, but you un, but but it's kind of understandable, not understandable. Let me, let me let me take that out. That's not what I'm trying to say. But you see at length of what they do to make sure that this history is is out of the mindset of quote unquote black people. Because if if this gets in the hand of black people and they get on their quote unquote nationalistic vibe, if they in impurity terms, if they convert into Islamism, it's a wrap. This is, you know, what I'm saying, like <laughs> talking about World War Three, like that, because again, you know, rightfully so. If you see a LeBron James and them pick up fezzes, and we start asking certain questions, it's uh, and, and and things start getting answered in this way. You know, it's like no, nah, things got to go back into into order because. Y'all wilding out here, man. Y'all doing some evil stuff out here regardless. 
You know, I, you know, it's almost shameful. I seen something the other day. I seen a video where they showed Gaza before October seventh and Gaza after, and the whole it, it was built the, the, before October seventh. It was buildings on each side. It was a whole road on the other side. Of, on on pat, the today's date, it's nothing but desert. They plowed through the whole thing on, blew up everything. There's nothing left. Mm. Mm -hmm. This is the sickness in the world. Indeed. But I, but you don't want no problems with a bunch of Joel and beads <laughs> and LeBron James running out here, Shaq. You know what I'm saying? Like it. Yes. But man, like a lot, man, a lot, man, working, you know, shoot, working his magic. So indeed. So this is another um another good reference for y'all too. If you want to pick it up, it's called The Unknown Arabs by a man by the name of Tariq Berry. Right? The cover says, it says the unknown Arabs, clear definitive proof of the dark complexion of the original Arabs and the Arab origin of the so-called African Americans. That's what this book deal with. <clears throat> and remember when he said. Arab origins of the so-called African American. This does not contradict with the prophet, because again, remember the prophet said all the inhabitants of Africa, who we descend from. He he mentions that we are descendants of Africa, like uh, um, in chapter chapter uh, yeah, like chapter forty-eight. We as a clean pure nation descended from the inhabitants of Africa. Right. And then it's verse five says the, that the world may hear and know the truth that among the descendants of Africa, there are, you know, what I'm saying, and, you know, so. So when she's saying like. Uh, the Arabs, of the, when he's saying Arab origin of the so-called African-American, remember the Canaanites, all the, all the descendants of Africa are descended to the ancient Canaanites from the land of Canaan. The land of Canaan is in Arabia. So Moors are Arabs. African Americans are Moors, Moors, Arabs, Arab, you know, African. It, it, it's all the same. Canaanite, Arab, Moor, Israelite, all of that. It's, it's all just, it's all like the same term. But one thing he said in the opening is this, and it, and it it touches on what you was just talking about, bro. He said, he said, um, Well, first off, the back of the book, it says the truth is the truth. And when I was reading this, it made me think about the Moorish Holy Quran and the 101s and what we learn about what truth is. Truth is all orders a lot, you know, saying da 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 da. And he said, the truth is truth and it can never become falsehood. Remember, the truth cannot change or pass away, it can only be hidden. However, it will always be present, waiting for the command for it to become manifest once again. Here you have it, my attempt to bring truth to light, to make reality, which has been kept away from the masses for so long, once again clear for all to behold. Now that that and then that reminded me of the beginning of the one, the opening of the one on ones. How he was saying how the reason these lessons have been have not been known is because the Muslims of India, Egypt, and Palestine had these secrets and kept them back from the outside world. He said, here you have it, my attempt to bring the truth, which has been kept away from the masses for so long, but once again clear for all to behold. Say, he said, quote, say, the truth has come and falsehood has vanished. Verily, falsehood is bound to vanish from the Holy Quran. But in the beginning of the book, he said, as the title implies, this book covers two topics. In the first part of the book, I attempt to correct the misconception that most people have of what a pure Arab should look like. I started by explaining the origin of the misconception and then proceeded to give the true picture of what the original Arabs looked like. In the second part of the book, I demonstrated how the so-called Black Americans or African Americans are descended from a conglomeration of peoples and tribes of, for the most part, Arab origin. I show how the so-called Black Americans or African Americans are in reality just as Arab as if not more Arab than any Arab in the Arab world today and should in fact be called Arab Americans. My purpose is not to prove that the Arab race is better than any other race or to claim 
that people whose complexions are different shades of brown as the so-called black Americans are, be are better than those whose complexions are red as Europeans or those descended from Europeans. My purpose in this book is to simply revive certain knowledge that has over the years become lost or concealed. I hope that the reader understands the importance of having knowledge of the origins of people and tribes and knowledge of the complexions and their appearance, appearances of these people and tribes. Having such knowledge can avert many conflicts. For example, the Palestinian problem, which has caused and continues to cause so many deaths, wouldn't exist if people had this type of knowledge of striving to revive. A people have been stripped of their entire country as a result of the lack of this knowledge. Surely, if the world knew that the Hebrews, who are the cousins of the Arabs, were a dark-skinned people, the European Jews would never have been able to claim Palestine as their own. If it were common knowledge that the Hebrews look like those in the picture below, the European Jews would never have even imagined trying to claim that they were Hebrews and that Palestine was theirs. Exactly. And, and you know, that's kind of like, um, that's that's kind of like the sad part about it, because it's just like if you only known, you wouldn't allow that to happen. Because their argument, what I've been saying on on these calls, is they say it is birthright. They keep using the term birthright. Mm. So if you really want to go back and uncover the truth, we're finding out that truthfully, it's our birthright. Right. So and if the rest of the world realizes that the, and all the rest of our brothers and sisters across the world realize that it will be a different argument. Um, but, you know, right now we just in such such a state of uh, capitulation. It's not even funny at this point. But, you know, it's it reminds me of the video I sent you earlier where the Ethiopian, which I have an immense respect for because they are holding on to what's left of their culture. Um, but when Mu Mussolini was trying to um, invade the country with the Italians in 1935, um, they petitioned for, quote unquote, black Americans uh, to come uh, to help defend the country. But, you know, thankfully, they did one. Uh, they did uh, beat the Italians uh, uh, with uh, Halas, uh, Selassie. So it, it's, it's one of those things where, again, and then when they petitioned, it was almost close to 15,000 Black Americans that signed up to go, but the United States government stopped them. And this goes back to what we're talking about. They probably, they, you know, they got cities from Chicago, New York, uh, a few other cities across the Midwest, um, in and in, in, in Detroit. So they wasn't playing. Like, imagine these these cats probably like Joel uh, Embiid and Shaq and, and LeBron and, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They probably, they, but either way, they won. But at the end of the day, it, it's still along the same lines in the <laughs> argument of what we're having today. If they knew, and it goes back to what the prophet said, you know, them re uh, releasing the secrets. Now we're getting the secrets. And this is the next level of Moorish Americans here is we have to tap into this information because, yeah, we know so much about the, the treaty of peace and friendship, the wars. And we, we know so much about the Europeans, but we ain't even tapping into uh, the, the whole Arab side of everything. You know, what I mean, to even hear that this the, 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 this book even identify us as Arab Americans it right. is enough for me to be like, oh, okay. You know All what I'm right. saying? This is enough information information to tie back, man. Yes, yes. It's long. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the that's the that's the point. So you know, now we start to see what how big this 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 mission is. This 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 truth this God. Um, about who we are you know we have the ability to set the world this is why the prophet said that um, unless these things are carried out by his people in the people of the United States right he said <clears throat> He says, so there isn't but one supreme issue for my people to use to redeem that which was lost. And that which was lost is the identity of who we are. You know what I'm saying? And 
our you know that nationality but that that nationality is not enough because you you it's not enough just to tell somebody you know you're a Moorish American you got to really break down the history like what does it mean to be a Moorish American because just like the prophet said in what shall we call him um he said probably two hours in the up-to-date library would serve to relieve the strain of our men of letters when the occasion presents itself for a title for these people because all it takes is to look into the history you know you find out that these moors were actually these berbers now you look at who are these berbers now you start looking into the berbers now you're dealing with greek and roman history you know then you want to deal with you know the arab side now you got to look into medieval arabic history you know but all of this stuff is there like you know all the history the history is there you know and again being able to tie into this and, and, and put this whole thing together like the prophet said he said, and that's through the statements above. Then the lion and the lamb can lie down together in yonder hills. So until we get this thing, to, so he, and he's saying this because, like you said, and like, you know, we've been getting that with this whole conflict thing with Palestine and just around the world, you know, really it's the basis of that birthright thing. Other people claim it, other people birthright, especially with that Palestinian conflict. And, uh, you know, once we get this thing right, you know, we set this thing, you know, we set this thing right. Then the lion and lamb can lie, lie down, meaning the rich and the poor. Mm. Right? And then what, what I also love about that, too, is that we got a whole, we got a whole chapter on master and servant. And that master, oh, no, matter of fact, it's not that one. It's the holy unity of the rich and poor. That's, that's the holy unity of the lion and the lamb. When we read that chapter, it teaches, it teaches us how to, how a rich man, the lion, is to lie down with the poor, uh -huh. with the lamb. That chapter actually breaks that down. So when he says, and neither will be harmed because love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice will be reigning in this land, he means that these teachings will be known and taught in America, right? That love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice, the, 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 the principles of the, of the Moorish American will be taught yep. in this. And until then, the lion and the lamb, the rich and the poor are not going to be able to lie down. He says, in those days, the United States will be one of the greatest civilized and prosperous governments of the world. But until then, it, he said, but if the above principles are not carried out by the citizens and my people in this government, the worst is yet to come because the great God of the universe is not pleased with the works that are being performed in North America by my people in this great sin must be removed from the land to save it from enormous earthquakes, diseases, ETC. And when he's saying to save it from enormous earthquakes and diseases, ETC, what he's talking about is look what they're doing. Most yeah. earthquakes is coming from them bombing and testing like, you know, environment down stuff. Like, they doing whatever they want. And this is what's causing these a lot of these earthquakes and tsunamis. There are a lot of these tsunamis that's happening in Japan and all that. You see this wild tsunamis. These could they testing bombs underwater. Thousands mm -hmm. of hundreds of thousands of miles off the coast of some of these places. And they causing, you know, ripple effects. Some, sometimes it won't be like that bad, but sometimes one of them joints go off and it will shift the land underneath. The land shift is going to make a shift in the water. All that water is going to move. It got to go somewhere and then yeah. come back. It go, this is where these tsunamis is coming from. That's why he's saying these enormous earthquakes and then these diseases because look at what they did with COVID. All these diseases man-made. Yep. The only thing to save us from this type of stuff is if we get this right and we teach this, we we, we teach this truth, and these people come around. Yeah, and, and you know, excuse me, uh, the prophet, you know, it was what you just read, um, where the prophet, you know, talked about, you know, from the people not only in this government but in the United States citizens, like he's talking that it's everybody's work. Like it ain't no division in that, or it's just diplomacy amongst each other's, obviously with the line and the lamb. But we all got a civic duty. We all got a duty 
to to fix the world you know what i mean and i and i honestly like i kind of feel like that, that, that you know that there's other stuff that has to happen um you know to be in place because man Pat, if the people don't if you don't look at palestine and you don't have a heart like <laughs> I don't know what to tell people because you know, and I understand like who's doing it. like oh, perfect example. I meant because I'm glad I'm glad we're talking about this. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm walking. I'm outside. I'm I'm about to travel for a little bit, but you know I live in close to the Jewish neighborhood, mm-hmm. and I seen a pickup truck with a big Israel flag on the back going down the street, and I said, hmm, that is eerily similar. That reminds me of the southern folk that they like to put the big confederate mm-hmm. flag in the back of their truck that's mm-hmm. exactly what he did um which triggered my mind like okay national pride mm-hmm. but this also symbolizes a sense of bigotry a right. sense of 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 a lion that don't want to lay with the land right you know what i'm saying like when i saw that it clicked and I said, yo, y'all, you, you know, y'all act like, you know, y'all act like y'all, you know, holier than thou. But at the same time, you still have the same principles of person that's just not is not in alignment, you know, and and and, and, these, and the mindset of it is, is almost, you know, it's corrupted, you know. So, it, man, when I saw that, man, I was like, oh, you know, you know, you know, a lot a lot will send you signals. And, and just kind of make, help you, you know, kind of be on point, you know, like, hey, look at that. Pay attention to that, you know, because, again, man, we we in some times this this, you know, it's a lot of wicked stuff and we're able everybody's able to see it, empathize with it and come up with their own opinion. And, you know, you know, I, I, I'm only seeing it virtually right now, but I, I would like the world to kind of stand up against this shit that's going on in over there in Palestine because it's sick at this point. It's mm-hmm. sick, and we all, you know, contribute to this shit. Excuse my language, mm-hmm. but well, at least I'm not gonna say us. I'm gonna say it's people who pay their taxes towards this shit because every every minute, you know, they they they're sending aid over there, and it's it's starting to get ridiculous, and and the people are getting sick of it. Right. So, you know, but uh, it's our duty, man, to really, you know, make sure that this flag, because, again, it's our duty to study this part. And just like I said, the secrets of this information was was always for me um, since you started. You know, you I, I always tell you, man, I love the Bible degrees because it's pulling me into the part that I'm missing because it's contemporary historians job to make sure cuz you think they don't they know they know exactly who we are and they already made this connection we the Johnny come lately but as Moorish Americans this is the next step in understanding that we need cuz once we have the arab principle once we got that islam degree it's, it's a wrap hmm. nobody can say nothing now nobody can disprove. Nobody can can fall back on on different uh, uh, black and Negro ideology di- diaspora. No, it's strictly Moorish. Mm-hmm. It's funny how some of this stuff, like I, I'll be around it, and it's still clues. You know what I'm saying? You show Abdul Rahman an original picture specifically said he's the prince as a Moorish. He's a Moorish prince. <laughs> Simple stuff like that. I ain't peeped that when I first seen the picture. So, you know, it, it's little things, the illustrations like that, man, that would really, you know, uncover the bits and pieces that's important towards our birthright and our conversation. And it's had, had like, and we got to, again, you said it earlier, we got to get away from that national kind of perspective. Moorish nationals, it's like, nah, man, it's a whole religion behind this. It's a whole culture. It's a whole history that connects you to land. You keep talking about national, it's, you know, that's almost kind of like a common, it's kind of like today's model. Back then, it wasn't no model of of, of, of nations, more so in the, in the political sphere of what tribe you belong to. Because this right. is the empire. You know what, you know, so, it, man, but it, it's, that's a deeper conversation as more as Americans, we got to start having and you know it's a lot of like surface information that only gets you you know so far but that, again we it, we got to stay strictly within the prophet's work imagine this dude was doing this in the early, early 1900s mm-hmm. so he already knew 
getting the fat, uh, getting the uh, uh, what was the uh, uh, fatwa, getting that fatwa. He already knew a lot of the secrets, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. In that time, because what I'm reading, this is some next level. Nobody in the early 19th century was speaking like him. No, and for That's... him to have the pieces like this, and we're uncovering what is what. You man, we playing. Look, Drew Ali was, he was so ahead of his time. So, like, when you read independent work on the biography of uh, Nova Drew Ali, you'll see, like, <coughs> they, they talk about his background, like, before, you know, like, there's record that his name was Thomas. Like, you know, it wasn't Timothy. Like, like we talking about... Uh, 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 let me see. Listen. Uh, yeah, here we go. We talking about <laughs> records, like we talking about, like, uh, like what you call them joints. So uh, this might not even be the one I was looking at. I was looking at something. But it has some images. Uh, oh yeah, that's this. Not, I ordered this book though, but this deals with the organization <laughs> in its earliest time. This is where I came across the individual that took the fatwa out on Prophet Abu Ali. Let me see if I can find the well, I think I think he's listed. This guy right here. Fatih Majid. He where is it at? Noble Drali. So it says that. In the early 20th century, Noah Drali founded more South of America. Ali considered a prophet by his followers. In 1913, he founded the Canaanite Temple in Newark, New Jersey, before re- relocating to Chicago, where he gained a following of thousands of converts. So they be having a lot of, uh, yeah, this is that book, out, this is the journal. Yeah. But they got a lot of um, good references. Mm-hmm. The Wikipedia sometimes, but he said, uh, "said during that time, Sati Majid viewed Ali as part of an attempt of spreading skeptical views about the finality of Prophet Muhammad's message, particularly focusing on Noble Drali's claim of prophethood in his creation of a text called the Circle Seven Quran." In response, Sati asked Ali to change his name and burn his Quran. Sati Majid also accused Ali of departing from Islam, which <clears throat> we could debunk all of this. I could, uh, I, I personally could debunk all of this using the Quran, or I could, I could make a very, 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 very good case. Like I feel, um, and I'm, I'm, I think on the next call we gonna go over this whole Sati Majid thing and dig into the Quran and some of his issues that he had we're going to compare them to uh what the quran says so it says uh he says in response he asked ali to die he said saudi majid depart- departed the united states on july uh, i mean on january 13 1929 so 
just like around the time of Prophet may have been in Cuba. Um, mm -hmm. he, he was in Cuba in, 20, in Havana uh, in 1926, but this is like probably nine months before he got assassinated. Yeah, yeah, this is like right before he got assassinated. Um, and this is actually before he actually created the wait. Was it nineteen? No, it wasn't nineteen twenty-eight. Yeah, he created the temple shortly before this. Yep. Like five months before this, he created the temple, and then he was. Yeah, I think also this, this, no, he was touring during this time. He was tour. I think he was no, no, no. No, he wasn't touring during this time. Dang, what? What the heck was going on? January nineteen twenty-eight. Um, uh, uh, he said, <laughs> yeah. Well, in the in the oral statements. Key 39 is say, Brother I Cook Bay, Grand Governor of Illinois, told Brother R. Love Ill, Grand Sheik of the Four Sons of America, and Brother C. Tyson Bay, past form, Chairman of the More Science Temple of America. See, and that's how you know <coughs> if, if, <coughs> if, <coughs> if we going off the oral statements right if you read key 39 it says brother c tyson bay chairman of the more science of america because you got some supreme grand sheiks or grand sheiks of certain temples they are the grand grand sheik and the chairman uh. How you two position? How you, how how you, um, how you two branches? You this that's you can't be two branches of the government. You can't play. You know what I mean? It's separation of powers. Uh -huh. And key thirty nine say that during the time of the prophet, he was the chairman. Prophet was the grand sheik. Because what's his name try to claim he was Grand Sheep? Uh, Claude Green. When the prophet went on tour, it took him three months to visit all the temples. While he was gone, Claude Green organized the coup with Kirkman Bay and the rest of them that's on the back of the one-on-one. -on -one. Well, most of them that's on the back of the one-on-one. -on -one. The only one that kept it real was Emily Hill. And maybe one other, it was like maybe one other one of them. But that's when they did the coup. While 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 he was gone, Claude Green, because he was the property manager for the temple, where the temple was at, they was renting from the Jewish dude. Um, Blumenbach, what's his name? Rosenwald. It was written from a man named Julius Rosenwald. I think he, he was one of the founders of like Sears Robux. Uh. Mm -hmm. His 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 plant his his plant was Claude Green, the business manager. So this this Jewish dude knew how much money the profit was making. Um, I know he knew Claude. I know Claude Green was let him know. And it came back that there was money missing from certain temples that Claude Green was managing, that Claude Green was stealing money. It was even accused that Claude Green was had something going on with Sister Pearl Ali, prophet wife. There was accusations that there was something going on there. Accusations. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So the story is, or one of the stories is that while the prophet was gone, Claude Green put all his stuff out the temple building. 
declare himself Grand Sheik. And um, shortly thereafter, the Moors killed him in the building. Shot him and stabbed him. So it was a group of them did. One story say the prophet was out of town on tour. The other story say he was down the street in another location. <clears throat> they said one of the Moors was informing during that time. They're saying that the prophet had uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Ira Johnson L. Take care of it. That's what they say. But this dude, Santi Majid, it says, upon reaching Cairo, he aimed to secure a fatwa against Noble Drali from Al-Azhar Al-Sharif, an Islamic science, scientific body and the largest religious institution in Egypt. Its headquarters is located in the building of the sheikdom of Al-Azhar in the central of the Egyptian capital, Cairo. The history of its establishment goes back to 927, blah, 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 blah. Right. <laughs> It says, uh, they, so it says Al-Azhar Al issued a fatwa in Arabic along with an English translation branding Drew Ali as an imposter and disbeliever. Saudi Majid also garnered the support for the fatwa from religious scholars in Sudan. However, there's no evidence that the fatwa reached the United States before Noble Drew Ali's death on July 20th, 1929. Saudi Majid seemingly intended to use this official condemnation of Drew Ali upon his return to the United States, intending it as a tool to attract followers among the Muslim leaders, um, among other Muslim leaders. He tried to raise funds for his return and requested Al Azhar's official recognition as a missionary to the U.S. Yet in 1934, his request was denied by Al Azhar, which cited his lack of the required scholarly qualifications for the role. Thus, instead of going back to the United States, he split his time during the 1930s between Egypt and Sudan. Contrary to Bowen, Abu Shuk claimed that the United States government ultimately took the step in ban of banishing Saudi Majid from his territory due to concerns of potential religious and social conflicts. Other scholars argue that he was not allowed to the U.S. because he was perceived as a potential Japanese agent by the FBI. So he got he got the fatwa, <clears throat> and he was gain, he was garnering support from certain scholars in the Sudan. So he was gonna bring he's gonna bring the fatwa back, and try to use it against the Prophet Abu Ali. So one thing that I'm gonna do, I'm gonna find the fatwa. I think I found it. I just got. I was up like super late. I can't even remember what I was doing last night. You like, found it, see? What the? <laughs> yeah, I think I, I found the. I think I found the Arabic one, the Arabic joint. I gotta. I, I think I did. I like I said. I was up like. I had mad mm. stuff going on. Um, but I'm going to um, find it, and I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna I'm uh, rebut it. Point by point, because again, they have a problem. Like like they said, his issue was. Um, <clears throat> viewed Ali as part of an attempt to da, 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 da. Spe special views about the finality of Prophet Muhammad's message. All right, so uh, I, so what I did find was I found because what what they're and Dag, see I I wanted to save this yeah I, I gotta save it <laughs> for Sunday but there is evidence that supports the fact that Muhammad. Or, or the verse that they use out of the Quran, right? That Muhammad is the seal of the prophet. And they use other hadiths that Muhammad said. But there's explanatory hadiths about that elaborate on what Muhammad said when he said what he said. Because <laughs> again, so the, the Quran says that, you know, Muhammad is the seal of the prophet. But you got to understand the back. So there's a backstory to that whole verse. That has to do with marriage laws and, and <clears throat> the um, 
breaking of ma that marriage law and spreading the rumor that Muhammad, as claiming being the prophet, was in violation of a law. So how, so it's about clearing that up. So they're saying basically he he can't be in violation of that law because first of all, the person you're considering that he would be in violation of is not his actual son. It's not even his adopt, like is the person he was talking about in relation to Muhammad at that time was his adopted son, Zayd, who was a, who was a slave, a, 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 conquer, a conquered slave that he freed. And, but they became so close that people thought that Zayd was his son. So they used to call him Zayd bin Muhammad. And Zayd ended up marrying one of Muhammad's cousins, Zainab. And Zainab and Zayd wanted to get a divorce because they just didn't get along. Zainab thought Zayd was, wasn't appealing. He was very dark skinned, supposedly, and or just unattractive to her. Because she it, it really because she was of a high, she was high born, meaning she was of nobility. He wasn't, he was a free slave. But he Muhammad, you know, he Muhammad, you know, he's very well liked by Muhammad. So they divorced anyway, right? They got divorced. Now, <clears throat> according to law, like you can't marry your son's ex-wife. Like if you got a son and he get married and he, get, he divorced his wife, you as his father, is like, you can't marry his daughter, his, his ex-wife. But Muhammad married Zainab. And people started talking like, yo, you married your son's wife? Like, and the story is that Allah or, you know, because it's like a law is narrated within the story, clears up the, the confusion that Muhammad is not the father of anybody among you. He, he, and he's the seal of the prophet, meaning he's authentic. He has the authenticity, authenticity, because a seal, what they'll argue is they'll say the seal, a seal is like, if you seal an envelope, there's nothing else that goes into the envelope after that. But okay, that's, that, that's, a half truth because that's not the whole picture. The whole picture is that Allah is the author of whatever goes into the envelope and when he and he'll put his seal on it so that it's authentic. But that does not mean Allah will stop sending envelopes or messages or messengers or prophets. You follow me?